Just when you thought that Soviet security forces were a thing of the past, the phoenix, or in this case, the double-headed eagle, rose from the ashes. The Federal Security Services, or FSB, are the Russian Federation's modern-day Czechists. This is the finale of a series I started as a fun project back in April 2022. It has since ballooned into a creature of its own, and garnered more attention all over the world than I could have possibly imagined. Perhaps appropriately for a finale, this was the most serious undertaking yet in terms of research and time dedicated to crafting this story, hence why this took so long to produce. The biggest challenge I faced when creating this was the information itself. Vladimir Putin and the security services have carefully crafted the image they want you to see, and Western journalists are very good at exaggerating the impact and the mystique of Putin. Both these elements have been at play since he took power, and personally, I try to carefully float within the bounds of accuracy and how things actually work rather than exaggerate or underplay the facts. Another layer of complication is the war. The first death in war is the truth, as they say, and recent information is suspect. So I tried to use as many sources pre-February 2022 as possible. If you've been following me up until now, you have probably figured out that I am a sucker for context. In this episode, we'll see Russia in transition again, just like we did in episodes two and three from monarchy to Bolshevism. Transitions are complex. And though this was a lot to bite off and chew, I hope this is organized in such a way that each distinct component comes together to paint a clear picture. We're going to talk about Russia's economic problems in the 90s, the first Chechen war, and of course the FSB. You'll also get two biographies, one on Boris Yeltsin and another on Vladimir Putin. So buckle up, this is a long one, and I hope the effort shines through as we embark on this final Russian tale. In this final edition of Russian Secret Police, we'll explore the history and methods of the FSB, an evolving Russian federation and the struggle to overcome the grip of autocrats and oligarchs. We'll see how Yeltsin gained power despite being a breath of fresh air and clashes with communist hardliners. We'll see how Putin was first handed the keys to Russia, got elected legitimately, and consolidated power. Who were Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin? How did the Russian economy fall into crisis in the 90s? How did Russian secret police adapt to the 21st century? You're listening to the Secret Police Podcast. Do you have a problem with authority? Because I do. And I'm on a mission to build a healthy skepticism towards those in power. My name is Jack, and I spend hours engaging with my morbid fascination with dictatorships and share with you the history and methods of the world's most brutal secret police forces. Let's recap. Last episode, we saw Mikhail Gorbachev rise through the party ranks in the Stavropol region and cultivate a power network, including the KGB chairman, Yuri Andropov. Gorbachev moved to Moscow to join the Central Committee as Secretary of Agriculture. He recognized that in order to address economic stagnation, serious changes needed to be considered, changes that Leonid Brezhnev seemed unable or unwilling to enact. Gorbachev bided his time to make the leap from a general secretary as Brezhnev, then Andropov, then Chernenko, died in office. Following Chernenko's death, Gorbachev was appointed general secretary of the Communist Party. He introduced first perestroika, or economic reforms, which the party elites and the KGB agreed were necessary, then glasnost, or openness, intended to reform the Soviet political system was detested by both the party elite and the KGB. Gorbachev was undeterred, but plans changed when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster forced the system to re-embrace secrecy. Gorbachev introduced an electoral body to sever the party's control over the levers of government. With the introduction of new parties, the union started to dissolve as people voted to boot out their communist leaders from power 
then broke away from the Union altogether. The KGB and a few party elites launched a coup as a last-ditch effort to hold power. They trapped Gorbachev at his dacha in Crimea and confined President Boris Yeltsin in a government building in Moscow. The coup failed because it had neither popular support nor the full support of the military. Boris Yeltsin signed the KGB out of existence on December 3rd, 1991. Think about that. One of the Soviet Union's most powerful institutions was put to death by pen and paper. Then the USSR itself ceased to exist, officially on December 26th, 1991. We left last episode just as Gorbachev resigned. Another thing that was going on was that former Soviet republics signed the Belovezh Accords in December of 1991 as well, declaring an end to the Soviet Union. Instead, these nations formed a loose commonwealth of independent states. In Russia, Boris Yeltsin assumed the position as president, but the government functioned under a Soviet constitution adapted around 1978. Yeltsin ushered in radical economic reforms by introducing capitalism to a population conditioned to socialism. He also oversaw the establishment of a new constitution. Let's get to know Russia's first president. He was really quite the character. We'll also touch on Russia's constitutional crisis, the volatile economy and culture in the 90s, and the creation of the oligarchy. Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin was born on February 1st, 1931, in a village called Butka in the Sverdlovsk Oblast of the Russian Federa- of the Russian Federative Socialist Republic. The Yeltsins were ethnic Russians who'd been farming this land since about the 18th century at least. His parents were Nikolai Yeltsin and Klavdaya Vasilyevna Starigina, and she was a devout Christian of the Russian Orthodox faith. Boris was christened in the Russian Orthodox Church as an infant. He was closer with his mom since his father sometimes beat her, Boris, and his siblings. His paternal grandfather, Ignati, owned uh, some kind of mill. Now, Grand Daddy Yeltsin's ownership of this mill plus family land meant the Yeltsin family were kulaks, or land-owning peasant farmers, bourgeoisie in the eyes of the Bolsheviks. In 1930, Ignati's property was confiscated by the government as part of Stalin's collectivization program. That's mine, and this is mine. Some of the Yeltsin family were allowed to move to a collective farm. They were subjected to the famine of 1932 to 1933, and little Boris often went hungry. Ignati and his wife Anna were exiled to another village in Sverdlovsk in 1934. Uh, Sadly, Granddaddy Yeltsin only made it two more years until his death. Boris and his family moved to Kazan in the Republic of Tatarstan, uh, so he could attend kindergarten. In 1934, Boris's father, Nikolai, was arrested for anti-Soviet activities by Stalin's OGPU. He was then sent to a labor camp in the Moscow district. Boris and his mom had to live with friends, and she made ends meet with a job at a garment factory. Nikolai returned home in 1936, and the family moved to Berezniki. Nikolai and Klavdaya also had two more children, Mikhail and Valentina in 1936 and 1944, respectively. During the Great Patriotic War, Boris did not take part in the front lines because he was too young. Uh, so, rather, he received his primar- primary school education at Beresniki's Railway School No. 45. He was reportedly a good student and took part in the Communist Youth League, Komsomol. His uncle, Adrian, was killed during the war. Boris went on to secondary school at the Pushkin High School, where he enjoyed playing sports and pulling pranks on his fellow students. One of these pranks would end up permanently disfiguring him. Boris and his buddies decided they wanted to understand the finer points of hand grenades and see what's inside them. I used to drive my parents crazy for taking apart all their pens, but I never once uh, tinkered with uh, hand grenades. Uh, maybe I, maybe if I had, they would have gotten off my back about eating my vegetables. Let's not blow this out of proportion. Yeltsin wrote in his autobiography, Against the Grain, quote, We decided to procure some grenades and dismantle them. 
to study and understand what's inside. So I volunteered to sneak inside the church, where the military warehouse was. After dark, I sneaked through three barbed wire uh, perimeters, and while the sentry was at the other side of the building, I hand-sawed the bars over the window, got inside, took two RGD-33 hand grenades, and got away safely. I was lucky. The sentry would have shot without warning. End quote. With the grenades in hand, they drove 60 kilometers or 37 miles to a rural area. Boris had uh, the wherewithal to tell his friends to back up. He said, quote, I persuaded the guys to get 100 meters away and hit it with a hammer, standing on my knees. Their grenade was lying on a rock, but I didn't know I had to take out the fuse first. Explosion. Fingers gone. The guys were safe. During the ride back to town, I passed out several times. At the hospital, with my father's written consent, gangrene started uh, in my hand, I was operated on, cut off what was remaining on my fingers, and I appeared in school with a bandaged white hand, end quote. Do you think Pappy Yeltsin got to the hospital and freaked out? Hey, which one of you fellas did this to my son? And Boris was like, now dad, please, let's not point fingers. So Boris lost his fingers and the future president Yeltsin preferred to pose for photos in a way that hid his deformity. But you can find photos online that show his left hand. Uh, uh, so basically don't play with grenades. Now, actor Anatoly Vladimirovich Kotenyov played Boris Yeltsin in the Netflix drama The Crown season 5 in the episode titled Ipatiev House. It shows Yeltsin with a full set of five fingers on each hand. And there's a scene where Queen Elizabeth and Yeltsin are eating lunch, and she accuses him of giving the order to destroy a party of house, which we'll get to. In 1949, Boris was accepted to a polytechnic institute in Sverdlovsk. He studied math, physics, and material science to become an engineer. He also studied German since he was required to take a foreign language course, but he never became proficient in the language. I hear you, Boris. Two and a half years of Japanese, and I never progressed past the first year level. Language just ain't my thing. Tuition for college was of no extra cost to Boris, but he earned a small amount of income uh, unloading trains. Sources indicate that he was a good student, having achieved good grades, uh, but took temporary leave in 1952 to recover from an illness. Two biographies point uh, to the disease being um, tonsillitis. College Boris played on the university volleyball team and started dating his would-be wife, Nanya Iosefana Gerina. The summer 1953, Boris hopped freight trains to travel around parts of Belarus, Ukraine, and the Caucasus. He finished school in June 1955 and went to work for the Lower Iset Construction Directorate in Sverdlovsk. The young engineer learned painting, masonry, and carpentry. He was part of a crew building the infamous Khrushchevka. Basically, in the 1950s, Soviet cities were in desperate need of housing, so pieces of apartment complexes were manufactured and put together into your standard commie blocks. This is where Boris will attract the Communist Party's attention, but so far, he had no interest in politics. You see, people in the party at Sverdlovsk wanted Yeltsin to be the chief engineer of these housing projects, but Yeltsin was not a card-carrying communist. I've neglected to talk about how one joined the Communist Party until now. It was not an open club, nor could you join just by paying dues. If you were interested in joining the party, you had to have a then-current member to sponsor or mentor you through the process. Your past was vigorous, vigorously scrutinized to ensure you'd conduct yourself by party doctrine, one trajectory would be to have joined the Vladimir Lenin All-Union Young Pioneers at a young age, then graduate to Komsomol. For adults, party membership was granted by a committee after a thorough investigation. Once you became a member, financial dues were deducted from your salary. Weird how the party of classless society needed money. Shut up and take my money! You received a booklet and enjoyed some sort of ceremony at a local party office. The sources were kinda iffy on this, so take this process with a grain of salt. Maybe joining was intentionally opaque. The part of the 
part of you looking into your background was consistent among the sources. And that step in the process nearly prevented Boris from joining. Can you guess what the party's hesitation with Boris was? That's right. They hated people missing a full set of four fingers and two thumbs. Boris blew off his fingers like a drunk American at a 4th of July party. No, of course, that's not why they... <laughs> that's not why they didn't want, want him. Uh, but the real reason was just about as dumb. The party didn't want to accept Boris because Boris's naughty grandpappy Ignati owned a mill. Yikes. I can smell the capitalism from here. The party didn't want him because Boris came from a line of kulaks. Why I think this is dumb, which you probably already thought of yourself, is because one, Boris was a child, and two, neither he, you, nor myself can help what family we were born into. I couldn't find any sort of written guidelines or process for how the party evaluated an applicant's past, so I don't know why they took issues with Boris's family background. This is just me speculating, but maybe their reason is as simple as he had exposure to mercantilism and is therefore tainted. Maybe Boris remembered the Bolsheviks showing up to steal his family's stuff and then uprooting them. I wouldn't want to join the people who took away my family's traditional livelihood, would you? Let's pause for a moment and make sure we got this. Individuals in the party were interested in seeing Boris become chief engineer in the construction of housing units in Sverdlovsk. He could not uh, become chief engineer because he was not a Communist Party member, but he may not have been able to join due to his past. I mean, honestly, where you're born is a choice, right? Boris deliberately concealed his past in his application and to his three sponsors, one of which was Alexander Vinogradov, Boris's godfather and ex-secretary of the Communist Party. Vinogradov prov uh, provided interviews in a documentary I watched for this research, and he said that had he known uh, Boris came from a family of Kulaks, he never would have sponsored him. I'm not sure how the Godfather missed that about the family, but whatever. Point is, Boris uh, purposefully omitted things about himself in his application in order to progress his career. Boris was accepted into the party despite some critiques on his character and uh, conduct on job sites by his sponsors. Uh, specifically, Boris could be too strict and rough with his work crew. Basically, he was your dickhead boss who's got zero bedside manner. But from the Communist Party's point of view, Boris was a young engineer with a promising future. Membership in the party, of course, opened many doors for him. He was appointed uh, the director of the Sverdlovsk uh, building conglomerate, where he um, turned his flaws into assets. He worked his crews hard and set high expectations, and they achieved several building records in Sverdlovsk for constructing and finishing an eight-story apartment block in 75 days. As somebody who is used to living in states where it takes at least that long for your bureaucrat to take a dump, that's impressive. <laughs> However, questions of building quality were raised in the next part of Boris's career. See, he met a man named Yakov Ryabov, who was the first secretary of the party in Sverdlovsk. When Ryabov looked for a construction manager for the Sverdlovsk region, his first choice was Boris. Ryabov understood Boris to be an ambitious person with a tendency to steamroll others, but the scope of Boris's work was management, not politics. Boris had certain public obligations as a party member. Ryubov helped Boris write and deliver speeches, taught him how to dress for formal occasions, and how to properly smile. Ryubov was essentially his mentor. Beyond work, Boris and his wife, Nanya, uh, spent some of their free time with Ryubov and his wife. They weren't just colleagues, they were friends. Boris was number three in line for first secretary of the region, and when Ryubov was ready to retire, he requested from Brezhnev himself that Boris be allowed to jump line and take the position as first secretary. Boris again had to write another application in which he concealed his past, but he became first secretary of the region anyway. He was a fish out of water at this level in politics. His career started outside the party, unlike many of his new colleagues who were adept to the political class. 
Boris also discovered that residents wrote letters complaining about the housing conditions. From what I can gather, Boris was unhappy about what he discovered at this level of politics. Yet, Boris did what he was told, of course. He was ordered to demolish the Apatiev house in Yekaterinburg, the house in which Tsar Nicholas and his family were executed way back in episode 3. Check it out. Boris was somebody who got things done, which differentiated him from career politicians in the party. He was good at obtaining funds for projects and seeing them through. For example, when there was a shortage of saucepans, he forced weapons manufacturers to produce saucepans. When a road needed to be constructed, he organized several different firms to manufacture their own section of the road and then join the pieces end to end. There was an incident where officials in Sverdlovsk requested funds to be appropriated for constructing a new building, but Moscow ignored the request. Boris took the initiative himself to bulldoze an old building and build it, um, and build a new one using money earmarked for something else, which was totally illegal and could have cost him his job. The man liked to play with figurative and literal grenades. Boris grew increasingly tired of the party's inability to make practical decisions in favor of adherence to ideology. Sverdlovsk became his own little dominion. University students were organized into construction squads to build their own apartments, essentially students exchanging their labor for a place to live that they built themselves. These squads, which we can call Boris Buddies, were taboo because they did not have approval from the party. People couldn't gather in groups to exchange ideas without the official party stamp of approval. Then, and this made the party really mad, guys, uh, when the apartments were done, people were, uh, oh my god. Okay, you may want to sit down for this. Or if you're driving, pull over. People started to congregate in the hallways and kitchens. Boris unintentionally created spaces where educated people could meet and exchange ideas, which was anathema to party rule. Another significant feature of this was that in the 80s, the party wanted to better connect the Soviet Union's countryside and urban centers. So uh, people from rural and urban areas were being exposed to one another and educated together. Then in Sverdlovsk, Boris initiated... Then, in Sverdlovsk, Boris facilitated gatherings outside of party control. I suppose people had always been able to meet in their, uh, or with their building mates in the past, but what I think is unique here was the party's lack of oversight of these gatherings. 1983, Yuri Andropov succeeded Brezhnev as general secretary. What happened in Moscow stayed in Moscow as far as Boris was concerned. Then Andropov died and Chernenko took over, but not for long because he also went to meet his lord and savior, Vladimir Lenin. Gorbachev rose to the post of general secretary. If you missed the last episode about Gorbachev and the downfall of the KGB, I encourage you to listen to that one as well. Last episode, we discussed Glasnost and Perestroika in greater detail. For now, understand that Gorbachev was much more open to political change in the Soviet Union than his predecessors. The conservative wing of the party grew weary of Gorbachev's reforms, and he needed allies. Gorbachev invited Boris to come work in Moscow. And in fact, this was Boris's third time being asked to relocate to the capital, and twice he refused. The third time's a charm, though. Well, Boris actually may have uh, had no choice because uh, if he didn't accept the new job offer, he may have been kicked out of the party. Boris relocated uh, to become head of the party of Moscow, specifically the first secretary of the Moscow City Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Man, the Soviets loved their long titles. Boris was essentially the mayor of Moscow, which was a similar position to the job Khrushchev had back in episode 6. Check it out. Boris criticized his colleagues at the 27th Party Congress held between February and March of 1986, establishing himself as a voice of disagreement. In a speech to Congress, Boris said, quote, yes, she did. It is because of the way the party and the state are run that the country's economy is collapsing. The mistakes of a few individuals cost a lot to the country. 
to the authority of the party and to socialism worldwide. And this is why I suggest that everywhere we withdraw privileges from all leaders who cannot justify their need for such privileges." End quote. I'm surprised this guy wasn't shot. Despite Boris's proclivity to rock the boat, Gorbachev confirmed Boris's membership to the presidium of the Central Committee. Boris, however, wasn't playing nice with the other kids on the commie block. His brash nature made him a lot of enemies within the conservative side of the party, including people who'd helped advance his career. The Komsomol got bogged down in bureaucratization with, with its stock phrasers, its instructions, its red tape. Just think that for this film only, we planned so many shock initiative weeks that we ended with more weeks than there are in the whole year. This is where true uncontrolled bureaucratization comes from. It comes from the work of the Komsomol. In this video, which uh, will be linked in the show notes, Yeltsin's talking smack about Komsomol in front of what definitely looks like Komsomol members. I hate over bureaucratization too. Boris would have blown his other hand off if he had to wait in an American DMV. I swear you go there with the documents they tell you to bring only to have a middle-aged person named either Susan or George tell you you're missing a document that requires God's signature. Anyway, Boris, somebody who seemed like a pragmatist because of his engineering experience, didn't mix well with the ideological and bureaucratic fabric of Moscow. He found himself in a city without many allies, and even Gorbachev distanced himself. Boris rage noped out of Moscow for Sverdlovsk to clear his head. He tried to formally resign from First Secretary of Moscow, but Gorbachev left the letters unread. In 1987, Boris suffered some kind of acute heart condition, possibly a heart attack. Whatever the case, he was hospitalized. Nanya described that when she first saw Boris, he could barely speak. I can only speculate that stress contributed to his condition. But this is probably a good time to talk about the vice that Yeltsin is remembered for. Hitting the bottle. Mm, he wasn't the first Russian leader to enjoy the drink. One a foreign diplomat remembered having at least five drinks with Peter the Great. Alexander III drank in secret to avoid his wife's judgment. Not to mention, she apparently couldn't handle the smell. So the Tsar used boots with extra white collars to hide small bottles. Recalled the drunken dinner party Stalin hosted at his dacha. Yeltsin took this to another level, or at least it was better documented. Yeltsin abused alcohol basically on a daily basis, and neither the responsibilities of the presidency nor his jobs in the Communist Party deterred the habit. I mean, yeah, that's how addiction works. Uh, Yeltsin's uh, head of security, Alexander Korzhakov, recalled that Yeltsin banned booze from the presidential kitchen, but then, when thirst needed quenching, he would slip and aid 100 rubles for alcohol. What are you going to do? Say no? Korzhakov diluted uh, vodka with water before it was brought to Yeltsin. Another incident occurred when Yeltsin visited Bill Clinton. In 1995, Secret Service agents found Yeltsin drunk and wearing only his underwear, trying to hail a cab to get pizza on Pennsylvania Avenue. Arresting me for what? I thought this was America! It would have been a lot funnier if the cab driver pulled up and saw both Yeltsin and Clinton in their underwear. They get in the back of the cab and the driver hears, Boris, your leg is brushing against mine and that's making the eagle's beak real big. It is impressive that despite his addiction, Yeltsin was able to defeat his opponents and pass a new constitution, but at the same time terrifying to think that the captain was drunk at the helm. Now, back to Boris's hospital stay. Um, Gorbachev asked Boris to come to the Kremlin to Nanya's horror. The doctors injected Boris with tranquilizers and took him to receive uh, choice words from Gorbachev. Boris took a demotion and was banned from speaking with the media. The slight motivated him to eventually take, Gor take on Gorbachev head to head, but first he needed some R&R &R in Sverdlovsk. Eight months later, Boris successfully won his candidac candidacy for the following party congress. He returned to Moscow to attack the party apparatus that had humiliated him and did so on live television. His televised presence at the party congress galvanized support for Yeltsin among Soviet people, and he stirred populist sentiment in such a way that made the Communist Party look increasingly irrelevant. 
One thing that I found kind of weird about doing this research is that I could not find any KGB documentation regarding surveillance on Boris Yeltsin, and it's likely this information just isn't publicly available. However, given his prominence in politics and vocal opposition, I would think it would be safe to assume that he was being watched. Why wouldn't they stop him? Well, I, I wish I had an answer, but we may never know. The KGB's inaction during the August 1991 coup may be an indication, but that's just me speculating. We know from last episode that under Gorbachev, things really started to unravel at the uh, Soviet Union's periphery and gradually spread. Boris talked about uh, pluralism and challenged the party. Gorbachev created the presidency of the Soviet Union in hopes to stave off the demands of some Soviet citizens for less party control. Boris campaigned for representative of the Sverdlovsk region in the parliament of the Federation of Russia. Once elected, he adopted a declaration of Russia's independence from the Union, and there was a clear trajectory for him from parliament to the Russian presidency. Boris Yeltsin was slowly but surely chipping away at the party and Gorbachev's power. In June 1990, Yeltsin resigned from the Communist Party at the 28th Party Congress. Some former comrades yell shame at Yeltsin as he walks out of the auditorium of the state Kremlin Palace. The room was designed so that the stage was lower than the rest of the assembly, and the main exits were at the, at the top of the incline. In an interview, uh, former Yeltsin aide Gennady Borbelis said Yeltsin headed into a new era, and as he walked out, he ascended, literally and metaphorically. Jokes on them, because soon the Communist Party would be banned by the very man they jeered. On June 12, 1991, Boris Yeltsin was elected Russia's first president with 57% of the popular vote, defeating several other candidates, including... Gorbachev's preferred communist candidate, Nikolai Ryzhkov, who received only 16% of the vote. In August 1991, the USSR became the Union of Sovereign States. That same month, a coup was led by high-ranking Communist Party uh, leaders, including KG, KGB chief Kryushkov and Vice President Gennady Yaniyev, which failed after about four days. The KGB held Gorbachev in Crimea and Yeltsin and some of his supporters inside the house of the government of the Russian Federation. Probably the most famous thing Yeltsin did was climb the tank to read a speech in complete defiance of communist hardliners. He shook the hands of two of the tank's crew members while the crowd chanted and clapped. Gorbachev resigned his position as general secretary on December 25th, 1991, and the Kremlin's Soviet flag was replaced by the flag of the Russian Federation. Although the USSR was gone, Boris Yeltsin and his government had the monumental task of transitioning Russia politically and economically. Politically in the sense of updating the old Soviet constitution, and economically by transitioning from a planned economy to a market economy on top of Gorbachev's failed economic reforms. For example, inflation totaled about 5% during the years 1980 to 1985, and by 1991, inflation jumped to roughly 160%. According to World Bank data, between 1988 and 1991, GDP fell 6.5% and GDP per capita decreased 7.6%. How Yeltsin's administration handled this unfinished economic transition actually made things worse for the Russian people. If you want to hear about how the USSR's planned economy worked, check out last episode, part 10. To understand the reforms, we need to understand that a planned economy is one that is managed by the state, and a market economy is one where supply and demand forces allocate scarce resources. But how does a large and diverse country like Russia, conditioned to socialism, transition to a capitalist system? We start with the Soviet government that owns the means of production and economic activity. Next, the Yeltsin administration had to figure out a way to distribute or sell state-owned assets to the Russian people. Sell me this pen. Yeltsin put a man named Anatoly Borosovich Chabayas in charge of privatization. Chabayas graduated from the Leningrad Institute of Engineering and Economics in 1977. 
He organized a group called Reforma that helped establish systems for local elections in Leningrad. Later, he became deputy chairman of Leningrad City Council. In 1991, he became a minister in Yeltsin's government and later became the Kremlin's chief of staff. He was also in charge of the State Committee on the Management of State Property, which handled the government's privatization scheme. Another man, Yegor Timorovich Gaidar, oversaw the implementation of both the administration's price liberalization and privatization programs. A graduate of Moscow State University, Gaidar worked for several different academic institutions and was a longtime member of the Communist Party. However, he quit in 1991 to join Yeltsin's reformers and advocated for free market economic policies. Let's quickly touch on price liberalization and its consequences. Price liberalization is transitioning from a state control pricing system to a market-based pricing system. In 1992, the administration released Soviet-era price controls from most commodities and consumer staples. Unfortunately, this policy led to hyperinflation, which peaked at about 2,500% per month in, the, in December of that year. This devastated people living on fixed income, so what little money people had saved was eviscerated. Inflation had another consequence. It Split a political wedge between Yeltsin and Parliament. Just the tip. Now, privatization, at least in the US, has certain connotations depending on your political viewpoint. At its core, privatization is the transfer of a business, property, or assets from public to private ownership. For example, suppose the government has a fine wines and dildos business they want to sell. Also, suppose I'm a wealthy investor and I have my lawyers and accountants look at the numbers and they conclude that this business is profitable, so I make a purchase. The government then transfers this legal entity, property, debts, etc., to my ownership. It is privatized because I, a private individual, now owns a slip and dip fine wines and dildos emporium, which I can run more efficiently than the public enterprise. Just the tip. Russia wasn't the only post-Soviet nation facing this problem. Gaidar, Jabayas, and their team looked at different models such as those in Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic. For example, Hungary privatized their state assets via trade sale, which is just a type of business-to-business -business transaction. The Czech Republic used voucher privatization, meaning the government issued a book of shares of stock in different companies for each adult Czech citizen who wanted to participate. In 1992, the vouchers cost 1,000 crowns, which was about one-fifth the average person's salary at that time. Thus, investment was unaffordable for those living paycheck to paycheck. The State Property Management Committee eventually settled on the Czech model, but privatization took a backseat to price liberalization and state budgeting. There are a few items worth discussing to better paint a picture of this uh, transition. First, the obvious. Russia contains abundant natural resources, especially oil and natural gas. Did I hear oil? This can be an advantage for a government in transition because it, because it can export uh, resources to generate revenue. The Soviet state controlled most of these extractive industries, with some exceptions due to Gorbachev's loosening of state control, but the Yeltsin administration needed to measure the value of all these resources for privatization. Second, the Soviet system placed certain restrictions on the use of cash by the average consumer. So what do I mean by this? Well, worker salaries were allocated in such a way that it allowed consumers to purchase only those goods and services that the Soviet planners offered in a given period. In 2015, Paolo Zanoni, then a partner at Goldman Sachs, lectured at uh, Yale University on Russian privatization. According to Zanoni, Soviet consumers could not have bank accounts. Nope. I did some digging online, I checked with a former colleague, and had a former Soviet citizen tell me that consumers did not have access to traditional banks in the Western sense, but they could earn about 2-3% annual interest through some type of depository institution. Consumers did not have checks, bank transfers, nor had access to credit nor lending facilities. Consumer purchases were, by and large, conducted in cash. 
The state, however, utilized banking and bank transfers to allocate funds to producers, highlighting a unique feature of the Soviet monetary system. One cash-based monetary circuit for consumers and another banking-based circuit for producers. And apparently this is like a unique uh, structure for a industrial nation. You're weird, buddy. You're weird. Uh, and the lecture is posted in the show notes if you're interested in this. In Soviet times, neither citizens nor producers had private property rights. The next two steps were important in establishing property rights, and those steps were corporatization and then uh, privatization. So Parliament passed legislation to strengthen both of those rights. It may not surprise you that no private property meant no corporations. The overall structure in the Soviet Union was party, ministries, and territories, no corporate entities. Legislation was passed to allow the, corpora the corporatization of state assets, which like privatization meant assets would be controlled by non or by a non-governmental entity, in this case, a corporation with boards of directors, managers, and stakeholders. The government would no longer be the sole stakeholder but rather private shareholders. Yeltsin's government thought that if the public owned assets, communist rule would be less likely to return. So the public needed some stake or investment in the success of the, of the new system. Easier said than done, of course, especially for people conditioned for the past 70 years to socialism, which I think now is like the third time I've said that. So, for example, a people who lived in state-owned housing, i.e. commie blocks, didn't necessarily want to accept ownership of their apartments and incur the cost of maintenance, even when ownership was literally handed to them. Imagine being offered home ownership at little to no cost and rejecting the offer. I know a, a few people who would love to not rent. The, the state property committee followed the check system by issuing vouchers for state-owned property. The reason was to quickly distribute state assets to investors and the public. Vouchers are documents redeemable for goods and services. In Russia, they redeemed shares in a company. Chabais and the state property committee calculated their worth by calculating they calculated by calculating, guys. Wow. <laughs> uh, they calculated the value of the country's industrial and natural resource wealth by, or or and dividing that by the number of citizens born by September first of nineteen ninety two. So roughly uh, 148 million people. This is likely an oversimplification since both estimates can vary by measurement and how you define citizens. I'm afraid we need to use math. By their calculations, each voucher had a value of 10,000 rubles, which was about two months salary for the average person at the time. And this was just the cost to purchase the voucher. It wasn't like buying stock in a specific company. So you could own a voucher, but not know the cost of a future investment in an enterprise. These vouchers were printed on tan paper about the size of a standard check, with faded ripples merging into a lattice pattern on the margin. In the center was a picture of the Russian Federation government house across the Moskva River, fitted into an oval with a ruffled frame like looking through a porthole. The check read Russian Federation government security valid until December 31st, 1993. Check forgery is punishable by law. Privatization check, 10,000 rubles. All in Cyrillic, of course. Completed with a red serial number and the year 1992. A Washington Post article from October 1992 shared the mood on the ground. The 72-year-old Anastasia Svetkova said, quote, I will get mine soon and hold on to it. Then I will find the right enterprise to invest in. Nina Kirashkina said she and some friends planned to pool their vouchers together and find a good investment. Ivan Mitronin, a 70-year-old man, said, quote, I'm an old person. What do I need to buy stock for? I'd rather buy salami. The article says Ivan made about 4,700 rubles or $16 a month. It would take him over two months to afford a single voucher. Despite these constraints, about 90% of the public participated in the program. 
Now, the fact that the vouchers had a face value of 10,000 was a problem for a society with little to no institutional support for savings. And as the 90s progressed, rapid inflation destroyed what value of money the average Russian possessed. Voucher distribution happened in a few phases. In theory, first dibs on the monopoly money would be the people who already owned and operated enterprises, that being then current managers and employees. In one version of privatization, 25% of an enterprise's non-voting shares would be provided to managers and employees free of charge. Managers could then purchase 5% of voting shares and another 10% of shares at a substantial discount. Unclaimed shares were then offered to the public. However, company staff, especially managers, were not thrilled at the idea that the majority of the shares could be held publicly and risk being replaced. A second version of privatization allowed for managers and employees to buy 51% of their company's shares before the rest were distributed to the public. Therefore, so long as the staff maintained a happy consensus in running their business, no outsiders could take control of the company. Company managers gained control over their businesses at minimal cost. Unfortunately, many managers also bought up the shares of their employees, who were either willing to sell them or coerced into doing so. The vast majority of firms privatized under this second version. A third version established later in 1992 provided staff with 20% of their company's shares at no cost, and they could later purchase an additional 20% at a steep discount, but version 2 was the most advantageous. When looking at who was able to avoid these vouchers, only those individuals who already possessed the means to take control of Russia's industries, namely factory managers, criminal organizations, and government officials, could enjoy this scheme. There were also no institutional investors like investment banks buying privatization vouchers. Foreign investment was also limited because a transitioning Russia probably seemed like too big a risk for foreign investors. One crazy aspect of this was that some company managers pooled their resources to, uh, together and created commercial banks to loan money to company owners to purchase additional stock. Where did these people seek to make their investments? It wasn't in Russia's small businesses. No. Those who were most successful secured a stake in one of Russia's natural resource monopolies. Think about that control the oil, gas, mines, and other tradable commodities of the world's largest country, and you'll make a killing. Of course, bad actors set up various schemes to sucker people into handing over their vouchers, such as fraudulent organizations that offered to take vouchers at or, or take vouchers as deposits. They'd show ads of people on fancy vacations only to run off with the vouchers and never return so much as a single ruble. It is my personal opinion how the voucher program played out in practice by enriching those who already had money and or connections shows that even communism could not stop people from responding to financial incentives, even those who should have been the most principled in Communist Party values. Chibayas, for example, increased his own wealth by providing financial services to other oligarchs, then appointed himself to the Unified Energy System of Russia, which was the country's largest electrical utility until 2008. The Russian oligarchs rose from this financial and structural transition. Oligarchs mainly arose from the ranks of former factory managers like we discussed, senior Communist Party, uh, senior Communist Party leadership, or people who supplied goods and services to the black market. Did you know one of the most popular items to sell on the black market in the Soviet Union were American blue jeans? All this was done very quickly. From about 1992 to 1994, two years is nothing for the world's largest country to shock therapy itself into a democratic capitalist system. The goal was to liberate the economy, to create something more efficient that benefited Russians, but that goal fell drastically short of its target. Blue jeans or not, poor economic conditions and the government's response were wearing on the Russian people and parliament. Yeltsin's economic reforms sowed distrust between himself and the rest of the government. 
1933, Russia's government consisted of several different authoritative bodies operating under the Soviet constitution established in 1978. Yeltsin and his ministers ran the administration. The Supreme Soviet Congress of People's Deputies, or Parliament, was the highest governing body in Russia. Each member was an elected official. They passed laws, appointed and fired officials, and had the power to impeach the president. Those last two authorities will be important in just a moment. There was also the Congressional Court of Russia. Compared to the Communist Party's heyday, this system was much more democratic. Was much more of a democratic system, uh, with uh, open public debate instead of one man with a cult of personality. I'm going to call the Supreme Soviet just Parliament f uh, in this episode to reinforce the fact that we are talking about post-Soviet Russia, but. As a legislative body, the parliament carried some semblance of the Soviet system, and not just because it was established by the old Soviet constitution. Parliament had many ex-members of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR who didn't care for Yeltsin. They correctly pointed out that thus far, price liberalization and privatization especially were not functioning as expected. Yeltsin accused Parliament of being communist and obstructing his vision, whereas Parliament fought Yeltsin at every step of his transition. December 1992. Things heated up when Parliament fired Yegor Gaidar. Yeltsin was pissed. Parliament also decided to hold a referendum regarding drafts of an updated constitution for the Russian Federation, but Yeltsin was like, Oh, hell no. He went on state TV in March 1993, declaring that the old constitution was invalid and he would impose, quote, special rule. The constitutional court said, Oi, you can't do that, you three-fingered bastard which basically meant Yeltsin's actions were unconstitutional and he could be impeached. Parliament proceeded with impeachment, but they didn't have enough votes to go through with it. Yeltsin dodged that bullet until it was proposed that a national referendum be conducted to gauge the nation's sentiments regarding the president. The public would answer four questions. One. Do you trust the president of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin? Two, do you approve of the social and economic policies enacted by the president of Russia and the government of Russia since 1992? Three, do you think conducting an early election for president of the Russian Federation is necessary? And four, do you think conducting an early election of the people's deputies of the Russian Federation is necessary? Media campaigns telling the Russian public how to vote sailed radio waves and blasted television screens. Yes, yes, no, yes became a slogan. The Russian people heard da, da, net, da, ad nauseum, the subtle implementation of earworms. Most Russians, in fact, voted exactly this way, and by doing so, affirming Yeltsin's trust and policies. At least that was the idea. But in order for the referendum to be legit, the constitutional court stated that the Questions had to be voted on by a majority of the electorate, not just the majority of people who signed up to vote. The referendum ended up being a waste of time since no parliamentary election nor presidential election took place. The two sides maintained a, 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 a stalemate and regrouped. Among the public, people were split in their support for either Yeltsin or Parliament. And you have to keep in mind that at that time, Yeltsin was a decently popular president because to many people he represented democracy and openness. May 1st, 1993, anti-Yeltsin protesters gathered in Moscow and marched on the Kremlin to clash with riot police. Protesters hijacked a truck and crushed an officer to death. June 1993, the parliament and Yeltsin meet to discuss the new Russian constitution. He believes a new constitution should be built more or less from scratch, whereas parliament wanted to base the new constitution on the Soviet-era one. Not surprisingly, the administration and parliament did not reach an agreement. Yeltsin upped the stakes on September 1st, 1993 by firing an ex-member of parliament and then current vice president Alexander Rutskoy, whose mustache is Ron Swanson's peer. 
Yeltsin accused Rotskoy of corruption, but he did not have the authority to just fire his vice president, according to the Constitutional Court of Russia. Only Parliament had the power to fire and appoint ministers. They appealed to the Constitutional Court saying that Yeltsin was being a naughty president boy and that he should uh, turn into a peach. Wait a second. No, I mean that he should be impeached. Then on September 21st, 1993, Yeltsin went on live television to announce that the entirety of the Supreme Soviet was fired and that this governing body ceased to exist. The parliament retaliated by appearing on TV and stating that Yeltsin's actions were unconstitutional, which they were, and that Yeltsin's position was replaced by Alexander Rotskoy, the wrongfully terminated vice president. They gathered inside the House of the Parliament or the White House, where Yeltsin just a few years prior barricaded himself during the KGB's coup attempt. Protesters who supported uh, Parliament gathered at the White House and were surrounded by Russian troops. The, the key here is that Yeltsin had the support of the military and police, but Russia, for a few weeks, had two governments, each calling each other, legi- uh, or each calling each other illegitimate. People took to the streets to commit violence on behalf of their respective government. Protesters rammed a truck into the entrance of the Austin Kino TV Center in an attempt to take over and to broadcast Parliament's cause. This was the last straw. Yeltsin declared a state of emergency, and on October 4th, 1993, tanks rolled into the city center with orders to shoot at the Parliament building, with all the Supreme Soviet members and some citizens inside. Eventually, the parliament members were taken into custody. Yeltsin won the little civil war and put an end to the constitutional crisis. A new constitution was adopted on December, or or, excuse me, or in December 1993, solidifying the Russian Federation. Throughout this series, we've seen security forces serve several different types of governments. The Oprichniki served Ivan the Terrible's Grand Duchy of Moscow. The third section on the Okhrana served a czarist monarchy. The Soviet secret police served a socialist republic. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia reorganized into a federation. If you want to get way technical, Russia is a federal presidential constitutional republic. So what is a federation? A federation is defined as a union of self-governing states or regions with their own autonomy controlled by a central government. Russia comprises 46 oblasts, or regions, 22 republics, 9 krais, another name for region, 4 autonomous okrugs, 3 federal cities, only 2 if you exclude Sevastopol and Crimea, and 1 autonomous oblast. Oblasts have their own governor or some type of local government. The republics have their own legislators, legislatures and constitutions, but are represented by the federal government in international affairs. The republics are areas intended as homes for Russia's many ethnic minority groups. Krais are smaller oblasts. Autonomous okrugs are predominantly populated by ethnic minorities and can be a part of another, of another federal subject. The federal cities are major cities large enough to have their own region. You'd probably guessed that those cities are Moscow and St. Petersburg. The one autonomous oblast is the Jewish Autonomous Oblast in the Far East. Quick detour here because this is pretty fascinating. Jewish settlers from Ukraine and Belarus first arrived in this region in 1928. And in 1934, the Jewish Autonomous Oblast was allowed to officially form to show that the Soviet Union's Jewish population had a territory to call their own, so long as they adhered to socialist principles. The capital was a city called Birobidzhan, where the official language was Yiddish. In 1940, the Jewish population in this oblast peaked between 46 and 50,000, which decreased through the rest of the 20th century. Only half that many remained in the oblast by 1959, and by 1989, the Jewish population was only about 4% of the total population because much of the oblast Jewish population relocated to Israel. By 2010, the Jewish population fell to just under 1%, or nearly 2,000 residents, compared to 93% ethnic Russians. This region had a population of just over 150,000 in 2021, which seems like a lot considering that it's in the middle of bumblefuck nowhere. 
each of these types of regions are supposed to have equal representation in theory, and to be fair, they do have some representation in Moscow on paper, whereas if you are a U.S. territory like Puerto Rico or Guam, you don't have any say in D.C., unless you somehow join the Big 50 Club and get your very own star sticker. But there's no way we are going to have a prime number of stars on the flag. Now that we've covered Russia's geographic structure, let's look at its political structure. The Russian government has executive, legislative, and judicial branches. These branches gain their power from the Russian constitution. This document declares the power or that power be vested in the three governmental entities or in these three governmental entities. The constitution also outlines the power structures of the aforementioned geographic subdivisions. The executive branch includes the office of president and appointed ministers, including the prime minister. The executive is head of state and commander in chief of the Russian armed forces. This person is elected by popular vote. As far as term limits go, um, we'll get into that towards the end. The legislative branch as a whole is called the Federal Assembly, which has two houses, the State Duma and the Federation Council. The State Duma is the lower chamber and consists of 450 individuals elected for five-year terms that represent different parties. The Federation Council is the high chamber and consists of 170 senators with two senators from each federal subject. Their job is to pass laws, maintain a budget, and sign treaties. There are more uh, parties than the Communist Party in Russia. In fact, the Communist Party holds only 57 of the 450 seats in the State Duma, whereas the majority party, United Russia, holds 325. Then we have the judicial branch, which, which consists of the Constitutional Court, which oversees constitutional matters, and the Supreme Court, which is Russia's highest appellant court. Beneath these are lower federal courts, and all of the judges presiding over these courts are appointed by the Federation Council at the, rec at the recommendation of the president, which I find interesting because in the U.S., our Supreme Court justices are appointed by the president and confirmed by Congress. At that time, Russia also held onto some elements of free speech. Most notably, TV shows could satire and criticize Yeltsin without fear. For example, the show Kukul or Puppets in English was a satire based on the British show Spitting Image that ran between 1994 and 2002. The show made fun of Yeltsin, Putin, and the government using puppet caricatures, and you can find these on YouTube. They're pretty, uh, they're actually pretty terrifying, I think. <laughs> uh, while the government was reorganized under the new constitution, Yeltsin made changes to the security apparatus. Going backwards a bit now, in November 1991, Yeltsin transformed the KGB into the Federal Security Agency, or AFB. In January 1992, a decree was ordered to create the Ministry of Security of the Russian Federation and abolish the previous Federal Security Agency and any remnants of inter-Soviet inter Republic security links. Following the constitutional crisis and the formation of the new constitution, on December 21st, 1993, Yeltsin decreed that the Ministry of Security of the Russian Federation be abolished and replaced by the Federal Counterintelligence Service of the Russian Federation, or FSK. As a reminder, throughout this series, we've seen this branding and rebranding of the security services, but no matter how many times you shuffle the cards, it's the same deck. The best sources I could find regarding the FSK are from the Central Intelligence Agency and the Library of Congress Country Study, um, which I had no idea those existed. The Country Study on Russia is over 800 pages long. Fortunately, they have the study available for no added cost on top of our taxpayer dollars if you want to check that out. Let's look in detail at Yeltsin's management of Russia's security services. 1992. Yeltsin made it clear that the security services could be revamped but look very different from the KGB, but he had a few priorities for the security services. At the top of his list was to check the power and ambitions of political opponents. Next, Yeltsin needed the security services to counter domestic threats like ethno-separatist uh, movements, terrorists, and organized crime. Lastly, they would perform counterintelligence against foreign agents inside Russia. When the Soviet Union collapsed, KGB networks and resources came under the control of new governments in the former Soviet republics. Moscow inherited the bulk 
of the KGB resources and agents. Five different agencies were created to take over and manage different pieces of the KGB. For example, remember back in episode 6 when we made our acquaintance with the KGB? They comprised multiple directorates, each with specific functions. The KGB's first chief directorate, op uh, directorate operations were handed to a new foreign intelligence service, for example. Other KGB directorates were transformed into their own separate federal agencies. The Ministry of Security was established to help fill the void left by the KGB, including several directorates, such as a second chief directorate concerned with counterintelligence against foreigners or fifth directorate concerned with internal political security. In July 1992, Yeltsin signed the Governance of the Security Ministry, which was later ratified by Parliament. This made some of Russia's more democratically minded and politically aware folks nervous because it seemed like a security apparatus similar to the KGB was taking root. Parliament had some oversight authority on paper, but that authority was never really exercised. The man who headed the security ministry was Viktor Berenikov, who was the interior minister in both Gorbachev's and Yeltsin's governments. Berenikov largely kept former KGB agents in the security ministry at their job. When Yeltsin and parliament clashed during their epic uh, power struggle, Yeltsin sought the support of Berenikov. Supposedly, he declined to uh, involve the security ministry to po in political matters. Instead, he implored Yeltsin to find a compromise. Yeltsin eventually wanted to use the security ministry to essentially wage war against the political corruption of his opponents. Again, Berenikov was less enthused. Yeltsin dismissed him in mid-1993 because, for whatever reason, Berenikov often did not lend Yeltsin his full support. Yeltsin shopped around for a new security minister, checked LinkedIn, and indeed, he appointed a man named Nikolai Golushko to run the security services. Golushko was born in the Ukrainian SSR in 1937. He graduated from law school at Tomsk University in 1959. He then worked as a KGB agent in the 5th Directorate, uh, regarding political d dissidents and became chairman of the Committee for State Security in the Ukrainian SSR. Galushko, however, proved to be an ineffective leader. During the 1993 constitutional crisis, which saw tanks open fire on parliament, Galushko refused to order the Ministry of Security to back Yeltsin. Man, usually secret police are like attack dogs, but this security ministry was limp. After Yeltsin secured power from parliament, he fired Galushko and disbanded the security ministry. He needed something with more teeth and greater zeal. This is something like the Federal Counterintelligence Services, or Federal Naya Slujba Kontrarazvedki or FSK. You can make fun of my Russian all you want, it's, it's pretty terrible. Yeltsin established the FSK in December 1993, but the law making the agency official was enacted in January of 1994. The agency was set up so the president had sole control over the FSK, eliminating any legal oversight by the parliament or the courts. The statute assigned the FSK, quote, the task of carrying out technical operational measures and criminological and other expert assessments and investigations. So, at first, the FSK wasn't going to have a criminal investigation side, but in the end, they were granted that authority. They kind of remind me of the FBI in their ability to investigate more, uh, more than violent crimes. The FSK was also tasked with um, combating smuggling rings, government corruption, and other economic crimes. The FSK investigated many different kinds of financial crimes and enforced that or, or enforced the transition to a capitalist based system. The FSK inherited the KGB's directorate structure via the security ministry. FSK contained 18 directorates, including a department for public relations. However, when the Ministry of Security was disbanded, some of those functions were assigned to other agencies. So the FSK suffered a reduction in staff from around 135,000 employees and agents down to 75,000. When the FSK gained the authority to conduct criminal investigations, they added 25,000 employees. In terms of leadership, with Galushko gone, Yeltsin appointed a man named Sergei Stepashin to head the new agency. Stepashin was born in 1952 in Port Arthur near the Korean Peninsula. 
He attended school at an institution called the Higher Political School of the USSR and graduated in 1973. He later attended the Lenin Military Political Academy and a Finance Academy. He earned a Doctor of Law degree and currently holds the rank of Colonel General. That's one accomplished spy chief right there. Alongside Stepashin's arrival at FSK, the administration was uh, working to attach an economic counterintelligence directorate. Stepashin announced the FSK would essentially help enforce Russia's economic transition, like I said, though these activities drew criticism because some people believed the FSK targeted specific entrepreneurs for persecution. The FSK was about to wade into deep and murky waters. Fighting corruption was one thing, but keeping non-Russian ethnic groups subservient to Moscow was another matter entirely. Yeltsin's handling of the situation in Chechnya contributed to his otherwise drunken stumble from power. Chechnya, or the Chechen Republic, is located in the Greater Caucasus, with Georgia on its southern border and the Stavropol Krai on the northwest border. Chechnya is mostly surrounded by Russia's federal subjects. Its geography is punctuated by sharp mountains, open steppe, blue lakes, and snaking rivers. Chechnya is a little smaller than Hawaii at a little over 6,000 square miles or 16,000 square kilometers. Islam is the predominant religion practiced inside Chechnya, in contrast to Russia's dominant identification with Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. According to the 2021 Russian, uh, Russian census, Chechnya had a population of roughly 1.5 million, 96% uh, of which were ethnic Chechens, compared to 1.2% Russians. It's a place that, one, I've never been to, and two, it stands out in my mind as being very different from Russia to the point where I forget Chechnya is even a federal subject. I think if you were to ask most Americans uh, if you could name a, a single federal subject of Russia for one, but some might think of Chechnya as its own country. Chechnya has been incorporated in the various iterations of, Rus of the Russian state for about two centuries, but not without a lot of kicking, screaming, and resistance. Stop, let me go. Chechnya's location became a liability because the Caucasus linked the Russian Empire to the Middle East. During the rule of Catherine the Great in the late 18th century, Russia sought to expand southward and establish new trade relations. Going into the 19th century, Russia fought to maintain trade links, repel the Ottomans, and quell resistance movements. In 1817, a religious leader named Imam Shamil tried to unite the Caucasus people under Islam to repel the Russians in the First Caucasus War. He was unable to accomplish this, however, leading Shamil to blame specifically the Chechens for, and labeling them as too resistant. Ultimately, the North Caucasus region was annexed by Russia in 1864, and Shamil was captured and sent first to St. Petersburg, then exiled near Moscow. Uh, and yes, this conflict lasted nearly 50 years. With Russia's victory and annexation, Chechnya fell under the domain of the Tsars until the Bolshevik Revolution. As the Russian Empire crumbled, the Soviet Union took hold, and civil war ensued. Talked about uh, that in episode 2 and 3. Check them out. A new country emerged in the Caucasus called the Mountainous Republic of the Northern Caucasus in March 1917. Unfortunately for the peoples of this newfound republic, the Soviets eventually tried to reclaim the region, especially once Joseph Stalin took power. The Mountainous Republic only lasted until about 1922, suffering conquest by the Red Army. Jumping ahead to 1941, when Nazi Germany invaded, the Soviets accused and suspected that the Chechens would ally with the Germans. This wasn't an unrealistic fear since one, the Chechens have a long history of resistance and might have risked a temporary alliance with Germany to knock out the Soviets, and two, other parts of the Soviet Union actually welcomed the Wehrmacht, happy to see the Soviets gone but unaware of the horrors the Nazis had in store. Moscow's solution was to exile Chechen people and other minority groups to the Kazakh SSR in 1944. With Chechens deported from their homeland, the Soviets demolished cultural symbols in the Chechen capital city of Grozny to make way for those sweet, sexy, not depressing at all commie blocks. Kidding, of course. 
the point of this was to make way for ethnic Russians to move into and live in Grozny. When Nikita Khrushchev took power in 1953, he initiated de-Stalinization, episode 6, check it out. And the Chechens were permitted to return home in 1957, but of course ethnic Russians clashed with the returning Chechens. It's like if Russia were to get a massage, the masseuse would be like, it seems you have a lot of ethnic tension in your caucasus. Do I ever? Uh, don't, don't read too much into that. Anyway. The Chechens reestablished their majority population by the 1980s, but whatever ethnic tensions existed were far down on the priority list for Soviet leaders. Chechens, for all they'd been through, retained a fierce self-identity and independence. And by the early 1990s, a former general named Jokar Dudayev organized a militant group that overthrew the communist government in Grozny. He declared that the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria be an independent nation. We here in the West tend to think of other countries breaking away from the USSR like Ukraine or the Baltics. At least I hadn't heard of the Chechen Republic of Ichkeria before this research. However, Gorbachev did them dirty because when he formally dissolved the Union, the Chechen Republic was not recognized and legally remained part of Russia. But Chechnya operated like a separate entity, which was more or less allowed by the Yeltsin administration because they were focused on the economy. In Chechnya, ethnic Russians, who at the time had the advantage of being the most educated and skilled in the labor force, fled the region due to ethnic violence. This had a negative impact on Chechen industry. On top of, F of uh, epino economic... Wow. <laughs> on top of economic depression, Dudayev's government was less concerned with government services and focused on arming militants. In 1992, a failed coup resulted in Dudayev concentrating power in himself. Now, I could just say the reasons for Yeltsin's increased involvement in Chechnya were oil and potential territorial loss. And whereas those are contributing factors, it is much more complicated. Dudayev crushed a second coup in 1993. His opposition formed a provincial council that positioned itself as an alternative and competing government. Civil war ensued between Dudayev's government and the forces loyal to the provincial council. This civil conflict was made more violent by the fact that when the Soviet forces withdrew from Chechnya, they left behind guns, ammo, and other equipment. Moscow saw the need to restore order to this region. Commercial flights to Grozny were suspended, and Russian forces established a blockade around Chechnya. Meanwhile, the FSK covertly uh, intervened by providing weapons and cash to pro-Russian forces opposed to Dudayev. These forces launched a a failed attack on Grozny, resulting in prisoners taken by Dudayev's forces. It was revealed that some of the opposition fighters were Russians employed by the FSK, destroying Moscow's element of subtlety. Yeltsin gave Dudayev an ultimatum. Stop it. Come on. Please. Give me Chechnya. That'd be like super cool. No, Yeltsin ordered all combatants in Chechnya to surrender and disarm. Dudayev responded with, Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. Yeltsin sent in the Russian army with orders to restore constitutional order. On this side of the ring, we have 20,000 heavily equipped but unmotivated and inexperienced Russian conscripts. And on the other side, we have 10,000 highly motivated, modestly equipped, battle-hardened by internal conflicts and the Soviet-Afghan war Chechen so soldiers. Your guess is as good as mine. Fight! <laughs> On December 1st, 1994, the Russian Air Force launched bombing raids on Grozny in preparation for the ground invasion. December 11th, 1994, the Russian army launched a three-pronged attack towards Grozny from the north, west, and east. Each column of Russian forces faced stiff resistance from Chechen fighters and civilians. Dudayev mobilized his militia who resorted to guerrilla tactics against the invaders. Mangled bits of humans scattered the streets from aerial and artillery strikes, galvanizing the Chechens to resist further. Between New Year's Eve 1994 and New Year's Day of 95, the Russians launched their attack on Grozny. They managed to capture the airport north of the city, repelled the Chechen counterattack, and then drove their forces into their urban center to capture the presidential palace. Things quickly turned into a quagmire. 
Russian armored personnel carriers were frequently ambushed by Chechen fighters and turned into metal coffins stuffed with charred bodies, frozen in desperate attempts to egress. Snipers shot soldiers deliberately in the groin, inflicting a slow, bloody death with a touch of humiliation. Chechen fighters strung the Russian dead and wounded upside down in windows of defended positions, forcing the Russians to shoot at the bodies of their own men when assaulting Chechen positions. Russian army coordination and communication was so bad that in the panicked confusion of battle, Russian units started fighting each other. We're taking heavy fire! We gotta fall back! Son of a- Boris, you chicken shit! You shot me! Whoops! Darn it! Sorry, Ivan! Chechen units attacked Russian artillery units outside of Grozny, but the Russians kept advancing. A new offensive speared by special forces bore down on the Chechen resistance while, artil ar while artillery leveled Grozny street by street. The Russians captured northern Grozny and captured the city by March 6th of 1995, at a cost of 1,500 Russian casualties, 30,000 civilian casualties, and an unknown number of casualties among the Chechen fighters. What the Russian army didn't accomplish was capturing Chechen leadership who fled into the mountains. The Chechen mountains provided a formidable fortress for the Chechens, who raided Russian columns and laid improvised explosive devices. The war became measured in blood rather than land. Guerrilla tactics slowed the Russian advance but did not reverse it. Two developments changed the landscape of this war. First, a man named Ahmed Kadyrov declared a jihad and encouraged foreign fighters, weapons, and cash to deploy to Chechnya. The infamous Mujahideen responded to the call. The second development, Chechen fighters brought the fight to Russian civilians. It's the morning of June 14th, 1995. A column of military trucks crosses into the Stavropol Krai. They're en route to a small city called Budyanovsk. The trucks position themselves outside City Hall and a police station. The fighters emerge and storm the buildings. Taking several hostages, the fighters raised the Chechen flag over both sites. Then they moved on to their next target, the Budyanovsk Hospital. The fighters stormed the hospital, capturing at least 1,500 civilians, including children and mothers with their newborns. Leading this group was a man named Shamil Baseyev. Fighting Russia was in Baseyev's blood. Supposedly named after Imam Shamil, the religious leader who attempted to unite the Caucasus people under Islam in 1817, Baseyev's family fought the Tsars, the Bolsheviks, and were deported to Kazakhstan in 1944. At Budyanovsk Hospital, Shamil continued this legacy upon a vulnerable population, newborns, who had nothing to do with the past nor the present. With the hospital in his clutches, Baseyev issued an ultimatum. The Russian government was to order a ceasefire in Chechnya, and the leaders of both nations would enter negotiations. If not, Baseyev and his men were ready to kill the hostages. Yeltsin had his balls in a vice, but would not negotiate with terrorists. The Russians surrounded and attempted to storm the hospital using MVD police and Spetsnaz from the GRU and the newly formed FSB. A federal law enacted on April 3rd, 1995 created the Federal Security Services, and the FSK was later dissolved on June 23rd of 1995. There may be some relationship between Baseyev and the GRU, the Russian Foreign Military Intelligence Branch. Baseyev took part in another campaign in which he may have received training from the GRU. Russian newspapers reported that he was in fact a GRU agent. It gets complicated and I personally can't say one way or another. Whatever the case, the joint attack to free the hostages was an utter failure, resulting in roughly 140 civilians caught in the crossfire dead and the hospital in terrorist control. By the 19th of June, the government gave in to the terrorist demands and ordered a ceasefire in Chechnya. The remaining hostages were released and Baseyev and his buddies were granted safe passage back to Chechnya. This incident highlighted the reality of a prominent threat faced by many nations in the early 2000s, terrorism. The ceasefire was a pause rather than an end to the conflict. Both Russia and Chechnya took the opportunity to move troops, regroup, and rearm, and by late 1995, fighting continued. Going into 1996, Yeltsin prepared for the upcoming election in June and July. It may not surprise you that his popularity was waning with privatization and the war 
bleeding into civilian life. Yeltsin needed something to bring home as a victory for his campaign, and the army did just that. On April 21st, 1996, Chechen president Jokar Dudayev was using a satellite phone to allegedly talk to a member of Russia's state Duma. A Russian reconnaissance plane intercepted the call and traced his location. Two Russian fighter jets were dispatched. They honed onto Dudayev's location and fired two laser-guided missiles. He actually survived. Nah, just kidding. He got crispy. Besayev announced the president's death on TV, and Yeltsin, of course, claimed this as a victory and later won his bid for re-election. But while Yeltsin was drunk on victory, among other things, the Chechens were busy infiltrating Grozny in preparation for an assault. On August 6, 1996, roughly 1,500 Chechen fighters launched their attack. They split the remaining Russian occupiers into small, manageable groups to pick off one by one. Columns of Russian tanks arrived to help relieve the embattled, their embattled comrades, but the Chechens used newly supplied rocket launchers to break Russian armor. Russian commanders freaked out and told Chechen leadership, hey, withdraw your troops or our air force will bomb you back to the Stone Age. The Russian army was looking at two bad options, continue the war and retake Grozny at great cost or withdraw. Lieutenant General Alexander Lebed called the ceasefire. Cease fire. Both sides negotiated a peace treaty, which was signed sometime between the 30th or 31st of August of 1996. Russian forces withdrew and Chechnya's quote-unquote sovereignty would be respected but not recognized. Casualty estimates vary quite a bit uh, regarding this war. One source said 5,732 of 100,000 Russians deployed were killed or missing, while 5,622 of 10,000 Chechens were killed or missing. Roughly 80,000 Chechen civilians were killed. Now, take these numbers with a grain of salt because... Um, that uh, 5,732 number was reported by the Russian army itself. So if you really want to venture down this rabbit hole, look up First Chechen War on Wikipedia, which I do realize is not a source, but you can scroll down to the casualty estimates and uh, the different ranges are provided um, along with citations. The First Chechen War overshadowed an important development in the security services, that being the formation of the Federalnaya Služba Bezopasnosti Rasiskoy Federacji, or the Federal Security Services, or FSB. They demonstrated some of their capabilities during the Budyanovsk hospital crisis. But let's go back to their establishment and talk about its structure and leadership. In April 1995, the FSB was established by a law on organs of the Federal Security Services, which outlined its mission. They regained some of the functions previously performed by the KGB, including jurisdiction over roughly 14 prisons and control of special troop detachments. The law permitted the FSB to enter a private residence if the officers had reason to suspect a crime was or had taken place. No warrant was needed. The officer in charge only had to inform a judge within 24 hours of entering the residence. Article 23 stipulated that the President, the Federal Assembly of Parliament, and the courts had the power to monitor the FSB, but for some reason, only the State Duma could request details on their activities. It seems odd the President didn't have this power, but maybe this was a way to establish separation of powers. The FSB could conduct intelligence operations within Russia and abroad in order to bolster the economic, scientific, technical, and defense potential of the Russian Federation. FSB foreign intelligence was to be conducted in collaboration with the Federal Intelligence Service, but these specifics weren't laid out explicitly. Liberal media outlets uh, reacted with concern to these developments because the FSB appeared to be the KGB reincarnated. Sergei Stepashin, the FSK chief, kept his job until June 1995 when Yeltsin appointed General Mikhail Ivanovich Beruskov, who spent most of his career in the KGB's Kremlin regiment, responsible for protecting the Kremlin, its properties, and state officials. He responded to Chechen terrorist attacks by uh, starting a counter-terror center at the FSB, including a unit called Alpha Team, which specialized in hostage rescue. Boruskov was fired after it was discovered that he ordered agents to pursue and arrest two of Yeltsin's campaign managers for corruption during election season. 
With Barushkov gone, or Baruskov, excuse me, uh, his deputy Nikolai Dmitrievich Kovalyov took the position as FSB chief. Kovalyov started his career in the KGB in 1974, made general of the army in 1997, and then was elected as a member of the state Duma. He served for about one year in the FSB before Yeltsin appointed a more permanent director, Vladimir Putin. If you remember from last episode, Putin was in East Germany watching the Berlin Wall and his country crumble on live television while trying to phone Moscow for orders. Mom, can, can you pick me up? I'm scared. He is the only living Russian leader we'll talk about on this show. For many of you, he may not need a dedicated biography. We'll go through his early life, KGB service, political career, and how he acquired and accumulated his power. Putin's longevity and power is nothing short of extraordinary. U.S. football fans cheered for 23 Super Bowls. The horrors of 9-11 and the subsequent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan unfolded. Roger Federer won his first Grand Slam singles title at Wimbledon. LeBron James started his professional career with the Cleveland Cavaliers. National football slash soccer teams cheered five World Cups. Steve Jobs gave us the iPhone. Sudan split into two countries. Kim Jong-il and Gaddafi found out what awaits dictators in the afterlife. Most of the Star Wars prequel trilogy, all of the Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings films were brought to audiences. Five U.S. presidents, six British prime ministers, all within 24 years of Putin at Russia's helm. If he makes it another five years, he'll meet Stalin's record. We're going back a ways to 1879. Spiridon Ivanovich Putin, old grandpappy Putin, was born in December 1879, studied cooking in St. Petersburg, and ended up becoming a renowned chef. Spiridon worked as a chef at the Hotel Astoria in St. Petersburg, and apparently once served Grigory Rasputin, old pickled dick, or maybe a gooey duck, from episode two. After the revolution, he became Vladimir Lenin's personal chef, and later cooked for Lenin's widowed wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya. He also cooked for Joseph Stalin. And you know, there's a, there's a scene in the Death of Stalin movie where the NKVD clears out the dacha, and you see a chef being pushed outside along with the rest of the staff, and I can't help but wonder if that's supposed to be Spiridon. Because Spiridon was a chef to both Stalin and the Moscow Communist Party's uh, boarding house, he was probably a member of the NKVD, though sources don't confirm one way or another. Spiridon had four sons. Tragically, two of them were killed in World War II. One of them came back alive and unharmed. And the fourth, Vladimir Spiridonovich, old Pappy Putin, was permanently injured in the war. Vladimir Spiridonovich Putin was born in 1911, and according to President Putin himself, Pappy Putin had quite the service record during the war. Other than this, details of his early life are difficult to find. At some point, Vladimir, the father, met his wife, Maria I Ivanova Shalomova. They had a son named Albert in 1930, but sadly, the child died in infancy. When Nazi Germany invaded, Vladimir Spiridonovich joined the fight. Get your salt shaker because uh, Putin himself detailed the hardships that his parents went through in a journal called uh, Russian Pioneer. Putin recalled his parents' experiences during the siege of Leningrad, and he also maybe possibly embellished his dad's, his dad's uh, service a bit. Now, details about the family trauma and the siege of Leningrad, I'm actually more than willing to believe since the siege of Leningrad was an unhinged cannibalistic frozen hellhole for the Putins. It was much the same experience or much of the same experience. Pappy Putin joined up with the NKVD in the early phases of the war as a saboteur. His unit rendered bridges and railways useless to the advancing Germans. This is the first time also we're witnessing father son secret police lineage. Apparently, Pappy Putin was being hunted down by German soldiers and only escaped by hiding in a swamp using a reed like a snorkel. That's pretty badass, if true. Not doubting uh, Putin Sr.'s service, I guess, um, just uh, Putin Jr.'s proclivity to bend the truth, like a KGB agent contorting a prisoner. Vladimir Sr. told young Putin another story of when his unit encountered a German soldier who lobbed a couple grenades at them, and one of them exploded near Vladimir. 
He woke up unable to walk, uh, but his group was stationed on the opposite side of the frozen Neva River from his position. Excuse me, ice on the river is great for walking on if sufficiently frozen and if artillery aren't trained on your location ready to shell the ice. Against the odds, Vladimir and another man crossed the river under fire, and Vladimir was taken to a field hospital where the doctors deemed it necessary to leave the fragments of the grenade embedded in his leg. Meanwhile, Maria gave birth to their second child, Victor, in 1940, which, talk about the wrong place, wrong time to have a child, um, to help keep little Victor alive in these important conditions he was born, uh, that he was born into, Vladimir gave his hospital ration to his wife and child. Soviet authorities took little Victor from his parents to live in a foster home. Not long after, Maria and Vladimir heard that their son died around the age of two from starvation and diphtheria. Nobody ever informed them of where Victor was buried, nor were they ever able to discover the location. It was only in 2014 that President Putin discovered his brother was buried in the Piskarevsky Cemetery in St. Petersburg. Also, during the siege, Maria became so ill that Soviet medics thought she was dead, so she was tossed into a pile of bodies uh, to be disposed of. Vladimir hobbled to her rescue on crutches and found his wife still alive. Both Putin's parents survived the horrific siege, but unfortunately, Maria's mother was killed by the Germans and several other relatives went MIA on the Eastern Front. Vladimir and Maria later moved into a communal apartment with two other families, all sharing one bathroom and a kitchen. This was the environment future President Vladimir Putin was born into. A quick aside, uh, sources say that three families lived in this apartment, so I'm thinking it was the Putins plus two other families for a total of two. But anyway... Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born on October 7th, 1952 in Leningrad. Maria stayed at home with Putin Pop while Pappy Putin worked at a factory. Young Vladimir was basically treated like an only child. If this reminds you of Stalin, that parallel has not gone unnoticed by people since both were the third and obviously only surviving children of their respective parents. As a kid, Putin used to chase rats in the apartment stairwell for fun. Nice. Vladimir attended school at number 193 near his home on Baskov Lane starting in 1960, and he wasn't a particularly uh, gifted student in these school years. Some sources indicate he didn't show a particular interest in much of anything. Vladimir joined the Young Pioneers, similar to Consumal in that it was a youth organization, but for kids ages 9 to 14, whereas Consumal was for teens and young adults. Putin discovered martial arts and latched onto that with zeal because his competitiveness in this area was unlocked. He dove into Sambo, a fighting style developed by either the GPU, the OGPO, or NKVD and the Red Army. He also learned Judo, which originated in Japan. His parents didn't approve of their son's hobby until his coach convinced them otherwise. He earned a black belt and is the only world leader at that level in the sport. Like I said, Vladimir was meh academically, uh, but he went on to high school at school number 281 that focused on STEM subjects, particularly chemistry, which he didn't much care for, but uh, was encouraged to put as much effort into school as he did his martial arts training, and Vladimir improved his grades. He also enjoyed reading Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, and Vladimir Lenin. He also studied German, which is his second language today. Young Vladimir also became enamored by the film called Sword and the Shield, uh, based on a novel by author Vadim Kozhevnikov. The movie follows a young Soviet spy named Alexander Belov infiltrating the Waffen-SS under the alias Johann Weiss. In his autobiography, First Person, published in 2000, Putin said, quote, even before I graduated from school, I wanted to work in intelligence. What amazed me most of all is how one man's efforts could achieve what whole armies could not. One spy could decide the fate of thousands of people. At least, that's the way I understood it." End quote. Around the age of 15 or 16, Vladimir waltzed right up to the KGB building in Leningrad and asked to join the intelligence agency, and this is where Putin got his big break. Are you? They told him to come back later. 
but he was advised that if he wanted to join the KGB, he should study law or receive military training. Jack Barsky told us back in episode 7 that the KGB never took applicants. You had to be chosen. So that's a whoops on Vladimir's part, but how's a kid supposed to know that? He eventually went on to college at Leningrad State University to study law. While in school, he met a man named Anatoly Sobchak, who would go on to co-author the updated 1993 Russian constitution. At Leningrad State, Sobchak taught business law. We'll drop uh, him off here, but uh, he's going to come back later to influence Putin's career. In 1975, Vladimir graduated from Leningrad State, and the KGB targeted him for recruitment. Most sources say he, quote, joined the KGB, but I think that's um, a pretty inadequate uh, explanation. But unfortunately, I couldn't find what about Vladimir exactly led the KGB to recruit him, but... Uh, but they did. I am the chosen one. Vladimir attended six months of training at the 401st KGB school in Leningrad. He was first assigned to the KGB's second chief directorate, i.e. the counterintelligence wing, then later transferred to the first chief directorate for foreign operations and intelligence gathering. In 1983, Vladimir uh, married Ludmila Shkrebneva, who was a flight attendant for Aeroloft, Russia's largest airline. They met at a concert in Leningrad, and I don't know how long they were together before marriage or what their relationship was like uh, since Putin then and now keeps his personal life tightly guarded. Vladimir and Ludmila had their first uh, their first daughter, uh, Maria, in April of eight of uh, of eighteen wow. uh, April of nineteen eighty five. There is some speculation that Vladimir married in order to advance his career because unmarried KGB men were less likely to obtain foreign assignments for fear they'd meet a woman abroad and never return to the communist hellscape. Thus, married KGB men had much greater uh, incentive to return home. Yes, this is a pretty cynical view of his marriage. I don't really like to speculate on people's romantic relationships. So whatever his reasons for getting married, Vladimir was slated for a position in Dresden, Germany in 1985. He and his family relocated to Dresden, where the couple's second daughter, uh, Katerina, was born in August of 1986. In researching Vladimir's KGB activities and record, I found that this is a pretty fuzzy topic. There is fact, fiction, embellishment, and downplay, so I'll just show you what I found. What is publicly known about Vladimir's job is that he worked out of a local KGB house called uh, Angelica Strasse, uh, posing as a translator. He and his colleagues sifted through documents and newspapers in search for revolutionary and anti-Soviet activity. They wrote useless reports and contributed to a pile of useless information. He collaborated with agents of a future secret police topic, the Stasi, as well. Vladimir worked his way up to the rank of lieutenant colonel and earned a bronze medal for service. There was the occasional recruitment of an undercover agent, but other than that, um, his time seemed pretty dull. Even chief of the Stasi's foreign intelligence wing, Marcus Wolf, said of young Putin that he was, quote, pretty marginal. Even cleaning ladies received the bronze medal. However, this downplaying of Vladimir's work may have been the point to keep the real operations under wraps. According to an article in Political by in Politico by Catherine Belton from June of 2020, Vladimir allegedly allegedly met with and supported a left-wing terrorist group called the Red Army Fra uh, Red Army Faction, not Fraction, also known as the the Badar Meinhof Gang, whose aim was to sow terror across West Germany. It wouldn't have been the first time the KGB supported terrorist groups, and in reality, the Red Army faction was carrying out guerrilla attacks in West Germany long before Vladimir even joined the KGB. They killed public officials, hijacked aircraft, and even lobbed rockets at NATO headquarters in West Germany. Supposedly, when Vladimir arrived in Dresden, uh, faction members presented Vladimir and his team with requests of weapons since they could not be procured in West Germany. The weapons would would then be dropped at a secret location and deployed in terrorist terrorist tactics across West Berlin. The Red Army faction and their activities were very real, but the information regarding Vladimir's involvement in all this is near impossible to verify, and that is because it comes from one anonymous source 
and ex-Red Army faction members are either still in prison or dead. No official evidence showing a connection between the KGB and any European terrorist groups has ever been made. But in espionage, that's kind of the point, if you want to speculate on this. If, if you hear that Putin was James Bond, that's probably not the case. And if you hear that he was just some nobody desk jockey, then, you know, that may not necessarily be accurate either. Back in Dresden, Vladimir observed the political winds changing course. By 1989, the Soviets were losing control of East Germany. An angry mob surrounded Stasi headquarters, trapping Vladimir and his colleagues inside. They called on Moscow for help, but none came to their rescue. Game over, man. Game over. Vladimir survived the assault, but it was clear to them that the situation in East Germany and throughout the Soviet Union was unstable. As a precaution, his team burned many of their documents. The Berlin Wall broke down in November of 1989, and Vladimir was recalled to Leningrad, where he returned to Leningrad State as a professor while keeping tabs on students who could be the next generation of KGB agents. KGB agents. He also reconnected with his old professor Anatoly Sobchak. Vladimir's personal opinions on communism shifted. He said, quote, it became more and more obvious to me, more obvious truth, that it was nothing more than a beautiful and harmful fairy tale, end quote. Marx and Engels go on the same shelf as Brothers Grimm and frickin' Peter Pan. Vladimir then resigned his post with the KGB after the failed coup attempt against Gorbachev. In 1991, Vladimir's professor pal Anatoly Sobchak became the first democratically elected mayor of the newly renamed to the old name city of St. Petersburg, i.e. same place as Leningrad. Sobchak came in clutch because he offered Vladimir a job as an advisor in his administration. Sobchak needed somebody with some familiarity with, familiarity with Europe. Vladimir was responsible for registering new businesses and encouraging foreign investment in the city. He'd soon become deputy mayor and chair of the Committee on Foreign Relations. Let's take a moment to just like appreciate how powerful of a position this was. Vladimir was in charge of who could register a business. New businesses needed property. St. Petersburg real estate was previously Soviet real estate. Vladimir controlled who received property. He was the dealer of the most valuable asset. Another reason Sobchak hired Vladimir was for his experience in espionage because Sobchak needed somebody who could work with organized crime rings in St. Petersburg. Obviously, Mayor Sobchak couldn't be seen as directly interacting with these groups, but Vladimir could. Additionally, Sobchak or Sobchak's administration dealt with ongoing food shortages caused by a decrease in the agricultural activity following the Soviet Union's collapse. The administration devised a plan where certain enterprises were allotted raw materials to sell on the foreign market. They'd receive cash, and the money was supposed, was supposed to purchase food. Here's young Vladimir showing a camera crew their work. Butter, 2,000 tons. Dry milk, 2,000 tons. So this, in fact, covers our needs. This is very impressive, I'll be honest with you. So here's the thing. Most of the food was never shipped to grocers. A city councilor was charged with investigating where the money went if, not, if it was not used for food. In a frontline documentary I watched for this research, the city councilor, Marina Sela, shows the documents she kept from the investigation showing that 124 million rubles disappeared with Vladimir's signature on it. Apparently, the money was used to quickly set up companies to fulfill these food shipments. shipments. Some of these companies were owned by Vladimir's friends, and they either made incomplete shipments or none at all. I think it is safe to assume the money was either pocketed or some food was resold to other buyers. A quick note about uh, Marina, Mar yeah, Marina Sela and this Frontline documentary. Um, Marina died in March 2012, and this documentary aired in 2015, so her interview like must have occurred before 2015. I commented on the video and asked if Frontline could clarify when the interview was conducted, so we'll see if they respond. Um, the other thing is, I would bet money that those documents were confiscated and destroyed by the government. Anyway, the sailor uh, recommended to prosecutors that Vladimir be fined, okay? Just fined, no jail, 
no job loss. Mayor Sobchak defended Putin. In the same documentary, Sobchak's widow, Ludmila Narusova, said that she thought the investigation was a ploy to make her husband get rid of Vladimir. No real prosecution of this matter ever took place, and Vladimir never faced formal consequences. In another case, Vladimir registered a construction company called 20th Trust, and they received 2.5 billion rubles specifically for legit legitimate projects. An investigation tracked where the money was paid to complete work, but no legitimate projects took place. Instead, the money was used to construct vacation houses in Spain. In yet another case, Sobchak lost his uh, re-election bid in 1996. After losing office, many of his closest allies turned on him, except for Vladimir. A corruption investigation was launched, launched against Sobchak, and he was questioned by prosecutors. Conveniently, Sobchak had a heart attack, and Vladimir arranged for him to be taken out of the country via private jet for treatment. Apparently, Sobchak's old allies were trying to threaten and intimidate the cardiologists treating the ex-mayor. With Sobchak out of politics, Vladimir needed a new job. So, he moved to Moscow to join Yeltsin's administration. The sources don't give many details about who exactly made the following observation, but it is said that, y that uh, Yeltsin's administration admired Vladimir's loyalty to Sobchak. At first, Vladimir was appointed deputy chief of presidential property management, and, and uh, similar to his job in St. Petersburg, he managed foreign state property and other asset transfers. In 1997, he was appointed by Yeltsin himself to deputy chief of the presidential staff and still somehow had the time to complete a PhD in economics from St. Petersburg Mining University. There are some questions about plagiarism in his thesis, as the Brookings Institute found several pages were copied from a textbook. His PhD is titled Mineral and Raw Material Resources and the Development Strategy for the Russian Economy. Link in the episode notes if you're interested. He rose pretty quickly in Yeltsin's government, which had a, a corruption problem. In 1998, the Prosecutor General of Russia, Yuri Ilyich Skuratov, was filmed having la sexy time with two prostitutes. The tape was leaked and uh, was aired on one of <laughs> it was aired on one of Russia's state-controlled channels. The <laughs> This served as a catalyst for Vladimir to pursue corruption charges against some of Yeltsin's associates. As for Skuratov, Vladimir told the public the video was authenticated and it was indeed the prosecutor general. And he said, quote, my views are well known. They are those of the president and prime minister. Skuratov has to resign, end quote. He's like, yes, I personally authenticated this video. I watched it once. Then I had to watch it again and several times thereafter. I paused it in places to verify the man in our the man was our prosecutor general in various positions. I verified the video in my office with the door locked. I took a copy home to do some um, extra verification there as well. Yeah, usually at night before bed. My hands were busy with verification round the cock. I mean clock. Back to the secret police now, finally. In July 1998, Yeltsin appointed Vladimir to the director of the FSB. It appears that information about Putin's time at FSB is lacking, but while he was busy directing, an alcoholic and age-addled Yeltsin was dealing with economic shocks and a succession plan. The goal was to pick somebody who could rebuild Russia from the dead heap of the Soviet Union, something Yeltsin clearly failed to do. One potential candidate was a man named Boris Nemtsov, who was much more uh, pro-Western than Putin and had real political experience from serving as governor of the Nizhny Novgorod Oblast. It seemed like Yeltsin was set on Nemtsov succeeding him, that is, until the 1998 Russian financial crisis. More economics. Simply put, a decrease in commodity prices decreased the price of oil and gas. This harmed Russia's revenues, so the government was unable to pay their uh, yeah, unable to pay their debts inside the country. For example, to laborers working on the Trans-Siberian Railway or foreign debt holders. Russia defaulted on its debts and the ruble was devalued, going from about 7 rubles per euro in July 1998 to 26 rubles per euro in January 1999. Inflation also increased to nearly 130%. This 
Crisis basically ruined Nemtsov's chances of succeeding or of succession because he was hoping that free market capitalist economics would help Russia. But as somebody who would eventually need to be elected by the people, thus earning their trust, the people didn't want to stake their future on Western free market principles. Yeltsin's only real choice now was Vladimir Putinov, the FSB's one and only secret agent sock puppet. Just kidding. Vladimir Putin. On August 9th, 1999, Yeltsin named Putin acting prime minister. One month into his new job, terror was unleashed. Between September 4th and September 16th of 1999, bombs detonated in apartment buildings in Moscow, the Republic of Dagestan, and the Rostov Oblast. Each exploded in the dead of night. It was like Russia's 9-11. The once obscure bureaucrat Vladimir Putin suddenly became a household name. During a televised event, he said, quote, We'll be chasing the terrorists everywhere, at the airports, or in the toilet. We'll waste them in an outhouse. End of story. End quote. The toilet! Brilliant. Gives a whole new meaning to explosive diarrhea. The government blamed rebels from a specific place. Can you guess? If you said Chechnya, you are correct. The apartment bombings were used as pretense for a renewed offensive in Chechnya, culminating in the Second Chechen War. Yeltsin had an interest in this as well, because the deaths of innocent Russians and a new war meant less emphasis on corruption investigations. On December 31st, 1999, Yeltsin resigned, and per the Constitution, Putin became acting president. Putin then won his election bid in March 2000 with 53% of the vote. For the rest of this episode, we'll explore the FSB's activities and spycraft using Putin's story as a guiding timeline and get as close to the present day as possible. Let's go back to those apartment bombings. Mikhail Ivanovich Trepashkin, a lawyer and former FSB agent and former KGB agent, smelled something funny about these attacks. Trepashkin looked into the bombings on behalf of one of the victim's families. More suspicious was the bad reaction from his FSB colleagues. They told him not to look into it if he wanted to avoid trouble. Now, shortly after the bombings, all the sites were bulldozed of both um, rubble and human remains. Now, whether these were uh, crimes committed by radicals or an inside job, a crime scene was destroyed. Further adding to the suspicion was a fifth bomb discovered in an apartment outside of Moscow in the town of Ryazan. Residents reported to police that a white van parked in front of their apartment and two men carrying large sack, carried large sacks into the apartment basement. If you were alive around 9-11, think of how watchful we were in public, especially at airports or at train stations. So these residents were probably on edge uh, given, the recent, given the recent events. The police discovered three 50-kilogram sacks filled with a white powder, which turned out to be a compound called Research Department Explosive, or RDX, or Hexagon, a common explosive in military applications. Each sack had a detonator and a timing device attached. Interestingly, the police in Reyazan caught the men who'd been seen handling the sacks. When questioned, they produced FSB identification. A few days later, then-FSB director Nikolai Platonovich Patrushev went on TV to explain that the whole ordeal was a training exercise. There is, of course, a lot of controversy about this. A special test was performed on the white powder that didn't detect explosives, and so the testing device may have showed a positive reading the first time for RDX due to contamination from a previous test because the operator didn't wear gloves. Another controversy was that the detonator maybe was a shotgun shell, which um, I don't think shotgun shells work that way, but I am by no means a ballistics expert. Um, now, also, no Chechen terrorists were arrested for the bombings, uh, and, and, and uh, any investigation into the matter was stalled. During the Second Chechen War, the FSB struggled to build sufficient human intelligence networks. It was their job to conduct effective counterterrorism since, in the early 2000s, Russia experienced a surge of terrorist activity. When Putin first came to power, the FSB underwent a thorough reorganization as outlined by a decree signed in June of 2000. The FSB consisted of a director, first deputy director, then nine other deputy directors overseeing six departments. 
Those departments were economics and security, counterintelligence, organizational and personnel, activity provision, analysis, forecasting and strategic planning, and protection of the constitutional system and the fight against terrorism. That last one is a mouthful. In 2003, the FSB gained additional responsibility when it was assigned the Border Guard Service of Russia, which added over 200,000 employees to its total staff. The FSB also acquired some of of, uh, Russia's federal agency of government communications and information. Now, this integration with this uh, governmental organ, plus the border guards, into the FSB consolidated resources and reduced infighting between the three bodies. How does one exactly join the FSB? This is a bit complicated. As we know, the former KGB sought out candidates. According to former Soviet spy Mikhail Lubimov, security security officers approaching potential uh, candidates was a far superior method. Nowadays, it seems like you can apply. You can get the application from the security services website, but you have to submit the application either in person or through the regular snail mail. Sometimes going into the security services after military service makes sense for people with those sorts of aspirations. The whole process is incredibly extensive with a thorough investigation into a candidate's education, military service, travel history, personal conduct, etc. The candidate process is rigorous and intense. That's how I imagine it is joining any reputable intelligence agency. Oddly enough, I'm actually personally separated by four degrees or, or handshakes to an FSB officer, but I've never met this person. That being said, it would probably be, considering certain events, a lot easier to get a former KGB official to be on this show than it would be a current FSB officer. When it comes to personnel, it is important to distinguish between a bona fide agent and information tricked or coerced from somebody. Coercion doesn't mean that person is on the FSB's payroll. According to an article in the Wall Street Journal, there is an arm of the FSB that is very good at, quote, blurring the lines between spycraft and harassment, end quote. The DKRO is not a bonus secret police. It's the FSB's Department of Counterintelligence Operations responsible for surveillance on visitors to Russia. DKRO-1 is a subsection that conducts this uh, surveillance specifically on Americans and Canadians. August 2000. An Oscar II-class Russian nuclear submarine K-141 Kursk was taking part in a training exercise in the Barents Sea off the coast of the Murmansk Oblast. An explosion in the forward torpedo room crippled the sub. A second, larger explosion blew nearly the entire bow off the sub, killing all 118 sailors. This was like Putin's first major challenge as president. In a particularly dramatic event, a mother of one of the dead sailors was verbally airing her justifiable grievances to a deputy prime minister during a televised conference. She was surrounded by several men and one woman, all of whom uh, looked as if they were either comforting the mother or maybe more likely asking her to stop. The woman, dressed in a tan overcoat, is shown holding a syringe, and the mother is presumably sedated since she suddenly loses the energy to protest. The Russian naval authority later denied this ever even happened, and uh, to be fair, you don't actually see the injection, and the mother appears to be wearing like at least two layers of clothing, which would be a factor to consider when administering an injection, but not an impossible feat. Shamil Besayev, remember him, the commander of the hospital hostage crisis or situation? He claimed that Kursk was sunk by saboteurs from Dagestan, a neighboring republic to Chechnya. Putin ordered these claims to be investigated by the FSB. On September 11th, 2001, two commercial airliners were hijacked and flown into the World Trade Center in New York City. A third plane was hijacked and hit the Pentagon, and a fourth, en route to the U.S. Capitol building, crashed in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Putin was the first world leader to contact George W. Bush, giving his personal condolences. 9-11, for all its senseless violence and tragedy, provided a chance for Russia and the U.S. to lay a foundation for cooperation. Russia played a significant role in building the international coalition against terrorism. Putin was, as we have seen, familiar with terroristic acts. And Russia has experienced attacks on its own soil, whereas America has two giant moats on both sides. In a televised address, Putin described the terrorist attacks as, quote, 
an unprecedented act of aggression on part of international terrorism. Terrorism is the plague of the 21st century, end quote. On September 12, 2001, the FSB's public relations directorate stated that the terrorist attacks against the U.S. and the apartment bombings in September 1999 in Moscow and elsewhere in Russia were links in the same chain. Putin appears to have been okay with a global reaction to eradicating terrorism, but U.S. adventures in Iraq to remove a dictator was where he drew the line. On October 23, 2002, a crowd packed into the Dubrovka Theater in Moscow. They settled in to enjoy a performance of Nord Ost, a popular Russian musical. The first act ended as normal, but as the second act began, unbeknownst to the spectators, a bus pulled up in front of the theater, carrying about 50 men and women dressed in black tactical gear and masks, donning AK-style rifles and explosives. They burst into the theater. The group's leader, Mavsar Baryev, and the other assailants used the theater's equipment to record a video for the Russian media. They identified themselves as a Chechen separatist group called the 29th Division, and they were in possession of some 850 hostages. Their demands? The Russian government shall withdraw troops from Chechnya and recognize its independence. If the Russian government intervened, the separatists would start killing hostages. About three days later, on October 26th, FSB Spetsnaz, supported by MVD units, assaulted the theater. The hostages reported that gas spread throughout the main hall before FSB units breached the roof and basement. By the time the crisis was over, an estimated 40 terrorists and 130 hostages were killed. The Russian government was never transparent about what type of gas was deployed during the hostage rescue. The survivors reported seeing some of their fellow captives and the captors fall unconscious. Chemical analysis from the clothes from British citizens caught up in the, orde caught up in the ordeal was conducted by Parton Down. Remember them? They did the chemical analysis of the ricin pellet found in Grigory Markov back in episode 9. Parton Down's test revealed the presence of carfentanil an opioid used in veterinary medicine to anesthetize large animals like elephants and rhinos, and remifentanil, another opioid that can be used in surgical settings. There were claims the FSB knew the theater was a target through uh, one of the assailants, a Russian journalist and a former FSB agent who investigated this matter would end up dead. In June 2004, Putin reset the FSB's priorities and initiated reorganization. The FSB would prioritize eliminating foreign espionage, ensure economic and financial security, and stamp out organized crime. The FSB's divisions would later include counter-espionage, service and defense of constitutional order and the fight against terrorism, border services, economic security services, counter-information and uh, international links, organizational personnel services, monitoring department, scientific and technical services, and organizational security services. On September 1st, 2004, terrorists entered school number one in the town of Beslan in the Republic of North Ossetia Alania in the Caucasus region. The terrorists were sent under the orders of Shamil Beseyev, and similar to the theater situation, the terrorists demanded Russian troops withdraw from Chechnya and reorganize and recognize the region's independence. Their leverage was over 1,000 hostages, including nearly 800 late elementary school to middle school aged children. The security forces, including Spetsnaz and Alpha Group of the FSB, as well as MVD special forces, descended on the school. Additionally, armed civilians and Ossetian militiamen joined the security forces. The terrorists threatened to kill 50 hostages for every one of their comrades lost, and they mined the school's gym with a, with a, a improvised explosive device connected to a tripwire. This was gearing up to look like a tragic bloodbath. The government entered into negotiations with the terrorists for the first two days uh, through a Russian pediatrician who was, for some reason, specifically requested by the terrorists. Uh, I promise you, they don't teach a uh, hostage negotiation in medical school. Inside the school, the kids were forced to stand for long periods of time in the sweltering gym with no food or water. Those who lost consciousness were pulled out of the gym by the terrorists, woken up with cold water to the face, and then returned to the gym. Some people resorted to drinking their own urine. On September 3, 2004, paramedics were permitted to enter the school to remove bodies. But as the ambulance approached, the gunmen shot and killed two paramedics. 
Explosions were heard from inside the gym. One bomb had apparently detonated on the roof, setting it ablaze and raining embers onto the hostages below. The explosions opened a hole in the wall big enough for some people to escape, but as they ran, the terrorists shot them in the back. The FSB returned fire, and the decision was made to storm the school, but who exactly gave the orders to do so is muddled. In the aftermath of the situation, deputy directors and the Ossetian regional FSB director will point fingers. Joining the FSB in the assault were several T-72 battle tanks, a BTR-80 armored personnel carrier, and at least one MI-24 attack helicopter. Shoot, a fella could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas with all that stuff. Conscripted soldiers deployed to the school were seen deserting the fight once it started. Apparently, cops panicked and fired their guns in the wrong direction. The whole thing was a mess and ended with nearly 350 people dead, including over 180 children. In 2006, the FSB successfully assassinated Shamil Baseyev, the man who held hostages at the Budyanovsk Hospital in 1995 and ordered the Beslan school attack. He'd been under FSB surveillance for some time. Spetsnaz located Baseyev traveling as part of an arms convoy, and they, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, y you know, they facilitated a meet and greet between Baseyev and his preferred deity. These terrorist incidents were not the only ones to afflict Russia in the early 2000s. Former FSB director Nikolai Petrushev said in March 2008 that by their estimates, terrorist attacks decreased from about 257 in 2005 to 112 in 2006, then fell to 48 in 2007. In May of 2008, Dmitry Medvedev became Russia's president, succeeding Putin. But spoiler alert, Putin will be back. We are not going into Medvedev's bio because, one, this episode is long enough, uh, two, I want to keep the focus on FSB operations, and three, Putin took a title dip but was definitely in charge. And just to mention something about the presidential terms in Russia, so before April of 2021, the Constitution stipulated that the president was limited to no more than two consecutive terms of six years. But in 2021, Putin signed a law that changed the Constitution so he could run for an additional two consecutive terms of six years. The reason why he let um, Medvedev become president and Putin took a theoretical backseat was so that he could remain in power, but he was actually adhering to the laws that were outlined by the Constitution. When he returned, obviously, um, the laws were uh, manipulated for him to remain in power. On August 7th, 2008, Russian troops moved to invade their southern neighbor, a country, not a state, that we have visited frequently in this series, Georgia. To provide some context, in the Middle Ages, Georgia absorbed a northern territory called Abkhazia. Then in the 12th century, Georgia was attacked and weakened by the invading Mongols. To escape the Mongols, a people called the Ossetians settled another region in northern Georgia. When the Kingdom of Georgia fell apart, both the Abkhazians and Ossetians self-governed their own territories. In the 19th century, with Imperial Russian expansion, all of Georgia, including the Abkhazian and the Ossetian people, were uh, absorbed into the Russian Empire. Georgia then declared independence in 1918 following the revolution, only to be invaded by the Red Army in 1921. See Part 4 for details. The Soviets permitted Abkhazia and South Ossetia to have their own oblasts and Soviets, so from Moscow's perspective, they were distinct from the rest of Georgia. When the Soviet Union fell apart, Georgia was the first Caucasus nation to bail out and the new government was steadfast in its claim to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which led to civil conflict. In 1993, Russian-backed separatists in Abkhazia drove away the Georgian National Guard, and then Georgian citizens bore the bloody experience of a genocide committed against them. In 2003, the Rose Revolution saw the installment of a pro-Western President Mikhail Saakashvili, who wanted to set Georgia up to join the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. With Western support, the Baku-Tbilisi-Jehan pipeline was funneled, funneling oil from the Caspian Sea to the the Mediterranean, bypassing Russia, which saw all of this as a threat. President Saakashvili made public his intentions to join NATO. Russian troops stationed in Georgia withdrew but remained in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. More Russian troops poured into Abkhazia, then Georgian troops entered South Ossetia. 
and despite the region being within Georgia's borders, Medvedev had other ideas. He mobilized Russian troops and launched a bombing campaign in South Ossetia. Russia's overwhelming force dislodged Georgian forces within a day, pushing into Georgia and seizing Stalin's hometown of Gori. The war ended on August 12th with a Russian victory, and Moscow formally recognized the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Neither region was integrated into Russia's expanding federation, and it is my limited American understanding that while they are recognized as independent by Moscow, neither region wants to join Russia. That's the quick and dirty version. I'm sure I left many of uh, aspects of this conflict out, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you are interested in Georgian history, Roberto's History of Sacadvela Georgia podcast is the place to go. So Russia constructed border fences to protest or to protect Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and those projects are managed by the FSB's border guard services. And the FSB at one point maintained a unit of about 1,500 personnel deployed between the two regions. The FSB gained additional powers to combat terrorism by 2009 in response to an uptick in terrorist activities. In 2010, Islamic extremists bombed the Moscow metro, including the Lubyanka station close to the FSB headquarters. Remember, the Lubyanka building had been occupied by Soviet secret police since the days of the Cheka. Now that we've made it to 2010, let's check back in with Putin. We left off with his victory in the presidential election. Once in power, Putin cleaned up Boris Yeltsin's uh, corruption by taking away the wealth and assets accumulated by Yeltsin's oligarchs, having those old oligarchs, oligarchs exiled or jailed, then redistributing that wealth to the Russian people. No, just kidding. That wealth was transferred to Putin's own friends. He created his own set of oligarchs, modern-day boyars from episode one. This is where we come full circle to the book that inspired this show, The Dictator's Handbook. In it, the authors outline the foundation of an autocrat's rule, maintaining balance of what's called the nominal selectorate, the real selectorate, and the winning coalition. Putin enriched those who wouldn't cause trouble or challenge him. The same with his inner circle. And over the decades, the voting public would be increasingly influenced to support him and the United Russia Party. Take the example of Mikhail Kordakovsky, who was made the wealthiest man in Russia under Yeltsin and the 16th wealthiest man in the world. In 2003, Kordakovsky was worth $15 billion, or over $25 billion in 2023 dollars. Kordakovsky became wealthy by building an oil company called Yukos, which he acquired by exploiting the privatization program. During a meeting with Putin and other oligarchs, Kodakovsky raised the concern that Putin and his inner circle were creating a model with which business practices with the West could be conducted in a way that involves bribes and corruption. Later in 2003, Kodakovsky was arrested on charges of fraud and was convicted. Yukos was accused of tax evasion, but Yukos claimed the government levied higher taxes on their business than it did on other oil companies. Difficult to say what really happened, but Kodakovsky was sent to a Siberian labor camp for 10 years before he relocated to Switzerland, and Yukos assets were divided up between Putin's buddies. To borrow from the dictator's handbook, Putin pays his friends just enough to keep them loyal, and he never takes from their pockets to give to the Russian people. There's ongoing speculation on Putin's own level of wealth. According to Fortune, as president, Putin earns about 140,000 USD per year, or the equivalent in rubles, and owns an 800-square-foot apartment, three cars, and a trailer. However, some speculate Putin could be the wealthiest man on Earth, or at least worth $20 billion, which would put him, well, which would put Putin between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. I don't want to speculate, but I, I will say that um, in all the videos I've watched of him for this research, his suit's go from ugly, gray, and oversized to sharp and tailored. That doesn't necessarily mean he is a billionaire, but clearly he can afford some nicer stuff. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny posted a video called Putin's Palace, History of the World's Largest Bribe, on YouTube back in January 2021. As of writing this, Navalny's video has received nearly 128 million views. The pinnacle of this nearly two-hour-long video was drone footage of a gigantic mansion with an adjoining garden complex built on a towering plateau overlooking the Black Sea near the city of Gelendzik in the Krasnodar Krai. The complex is complete with a greenhouse the size of a smaller mansion, sculptures, two helipads, and walls of lush hedges cutting through sprawling gardens. 
The video was and is probably still highly controversial. An oligarch named Arkady Romanov Romanovich uh, Rotenberg said that he is the actual owner of this palace, not Putin. Whatever the case, Navalny, like many of Putin's uh, other opposition figures, have ended up... Um, uh, how do you say... Um, they have ended up with free skydiving lessons, where at the end, you meet Jesus. Remember Boris Nemtsov? He was uh, Yeltsin's chosen successor until the 1998 Russian financial crisis. Under Putin's government, Nemtsov spent time in jail for uh, unauthorized protesting. On February 27th, 2015, Nemtsov was shot dead while walking past the Kremlin. He'd been tailed by the FSB leading up to the assassination. Alexei Navalny himself was poisoned in August 2020 by a chemical agent called Novichok. Navalny's team tricked an FSB officer into confessing that Navalny absorbed the nerve agent through his underpants. Alexander Litvinenko, former officer of both the KGB and the FSB, was mysteriously poisoned in November 2006. It took a team of doctors and somebody with specialized knowledge of alpha particles to figure out that Litvinenko was poisoned with the radioactive isotope polonium-210, which was administered via ingestion in his tea. At the FSB, Litvinenko worked in the department tasked with fighting organized crime. He accused Putin and the FSB of involvement in the Moscow apartment bombings, the theater hostage crisis, and other covert operations. He also accused the government of assassinating Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya, who reported on the Second Chechen War and was poisoned while traveling from Moscow to the Rostov-on-Don to help with the Belsen school hostage crisis. For these revelations Litvinenko sought political asylum in the United Kingdom. One evening, he met with two ex-KGB agents, Andrei Lugovoy and Dmitry Kovtun, at the Millennium Hotel in London. Interestingly, Lugovoy was the ex-bodyguard of Yegor Gaidar, the Yeltsin official who oversaw the price liberalization and privatization programs. Why they met, I'm not sure, but um, Litvinenko also met with an Italian academic, Mario Scaramella, at a sushi bar in Piccadilly to exchange documents about the death of Anna Politkovskaya. That night, Litvinenko fell ill and vomited his guts out until morning. On November 4th, he was admitted to the Barrett General Hospital, and by November 24th, he was dead. Does Putin explicitly order the deaths of his opposition, or his, is his style more nuanced? I've heard people describe his leadership style as one of, quote, signaling, which I think means he steers his administration in a certain direction, and his deputies and the supporting bureaucratic system interprets the desired outcomes. The FSB being the security bureaucracy likely operates the same way. If this is truly the system, and it is likely we won't know exactly how the day-to-day -day governing works for a while, then it gives Putin insulation from direct involvement and therefore plausible deniability. If listening to this episode has shown you anything about me, it's that I'm a sucker for details and just, quote, signaling isn't a satisfactory answer. Business Insider has a pretty interesting article from July 2018 about Putin's daily routine, but unfortunately, as far as geopolitical and strategic thinking goes and how the FSB makes the sausage, we likely won't know the details of that for a while. Just a few items from the Business Insider article. Uh, Putin is a night owl. He tends to do most of his work in the wee hours. Honestly, same. He wakes in the late morning and eats a breakfast of an omelet and a quail egg around noon. Next, he spends at least an hour in the pool and another hour lifting weights. He gets to work in the afternoon reading briefs from physical binders, paper documents, and takes calls from landlines. He tries not to use computers nor a smartphone. He doesn't consume alcohol except at specific functions. All of his food is carefully curated. No food items are accepted as gifts unless cleared by the Kremlin first. He has several dogs. One of them, a black lab named Connie, interrupted a meeting between himself and German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has sinophobia, extreme fear of dogs. Putin also appears to enjoy tailored suits from Keton or uh, Brioni that will set you back as much as 4, 7, or 12 grand a piece. The last three things we'll touch on before wrapping up uh, or wrapping this up um, are the FSB's role in Crimea's, uh, in Crimea's annexation, the 2016 presidential election, and the current Ukraine war. I am so sorry. My, my brain and my, my mouth muscles are just like not lining up through this whole thing. Anyway.
The reasons why Russia annexed Crimea are complicated. Russia saw Western influence in Ukraine's desire to join NATO as a threat. Annexing Crimea sent a strong message and sparked unrest between the Ukrainian government and Russian-backed separatist forces in the east. Crimea itself we haven't talked about much on this show. It's a peninsula nearly surrounded on all sides by the Black Sea, and oh man has this place been fought over because it's highly st- it's a highly strategic piece of real estate. Crimea became part of the Russian Empire in 1783 when Catherine the Great defeated the Ottomans. But in 1954, Nikita Khrushchev transferred Crimea back to Ukraine as a symbolic gesture, but possibly, and perhaps more pragmatically, to increase his own political support in the power struggle against Melenkov. Khrushchev was also Ukrainian, so make, uh, make of that what you will in his motivations to return Crimea. Leading up to the 2014 annexation, FSB and GRU provided intelligence and other resources in preparing for the invasion. According to the U.S. State Department, FSB agents conducted kidnappings and tortures of non-Russians in Crimea. Then, the unthinkable happened. On July 17, 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 flew over Russian-controlled airspace in the Donetsk region en route to Kuala Lumpur from Amsterdam. Russian-controlled forces detected the passenger jet and fired a surface-to-air missile. The projectile detonated close to the fuselage, spraying hundreds of birdshot-like shards tearing through the aluminum skin. All 298 people on board died, including a Malaysian actress and a Dutch senator. Wars have been started over less than this. In the aftermath of the attack, Donbass separatist leader Igor Vesvoldovich Gurkin A former FSB officer himself took credit for shooting down what he thought was a Ukrainian Air Force AN-26 transport plane. Gherkin dismissed his mistake, saying that nobody was on the passenger jet except hundreds of, quote, rotting corpses. Through this story, we've seen the FSB conduct themselves using similar tactics as their secret police ancestors. But the FSB have a distinct technological advantage the Cheka could only dream of, social media. Social media gave the Russian security forces unprecedented outreach that could influence people on a very personal and intimate level via Facebook and other platforms. Leading up to the 2016 US presidential election, the FSB went to work. I should point out that, in my opinion, Russian secret police have likely been influencing American politics and vice versa for a very long time. In episode 2, The Okrana, we explored the idea that labor unions were feared in the US in the early 1900s, partly because maybe Okrana agent provocateurs influenced American workers to join forces against their employers. In 2016, the methods flew through cyberspace. What is and was alleged is that the Kremlin orchestrated a campaign to utilize social media to influence Americans to back the Kremlin's preferred presidential candidate and disparage the unfavored candidate. What is true is, yes, you can influence hundreds of thousands of or millions of people to take action via the power of social media, and not necessarily for nefarious purposes. Remember the ice bucket challenge? Vin Diesel challenged uh, Putin to that, in fact, and I I wonder if he did it. Probably not. Uh, What is true is that nefarious actors can create fake or bot accounts to spread specific messages, share memes, and other content to get people riled up, etc. What is true is that bad actors, again, whether with the Russian state's blessing or not, tried to influence the election, but its ultimate effect is still up for debate. An article in Vox from January 2023 shows a study that conducted that concluded that while Russian troll farms and the like existed, their real impact was minimal or overstated by the mainstream media. Now, I am personally disturbed by any attempt of foreign entities to influence our elections. It is also significant that if the real impact of disinformation from Kremlin-linked accounts had little effect, it certainly had an outsized impact on the level of fear in my country. There is also a narrative uh, out there that there needed to be a better explanation as to why one candidate lost. It couldn't just be as simple as they lost because they were unpopular. No, there had to be foreign influence. And simply put, there was for sure an attempted or an attempted mass manipulation campaign, but its ultimate effect is still up for debate. At the end of the day, the FSB, the GRU, and other security services utilize social engineering and straight-up hacking to conduct espionage, right? 
why risk human assets when you can steal sensitive data from the comfort of your own home? Now we arrive finally at modern times. What is the FSB's role in the current war in Ukraine? The FSB's role appears to be a mixed bag. While the FSB provided intelligence leading up to the invasion, they obviously drastically miscalculated the level of Ukrainian resistance. FSB agents infiltrated Mariupol to filter to filter Ukrainians from the Russian population using searches, tortures, and forced deportations deep into the Russian interior. I feel for the victims of this war. Around the time of the invasion, I couldn't help but think of my grandmother. She was a British firecracker who'd served in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force during World War II. She witnessed Hitler's relentless bombing of London, and she told me about the time she saw a building suddenly raised by what I presumed to be a V-2 rocket, buzz bombs with a droning engine. Not even my mom had heard this story. My grandmother didn't live to see this Ukraine war, but I couldn't help but wonder what she'd think of it. Hers? My grandfather's, a whole generation's tireless struggle to defeat tyranny. But 80 years later, men are still being burned alive in tanks, to say nothing of the countless conflicts and atrocities that have occurred since World War II. Our species' proclivity for violence prevails. On that cheerful note, let's recap. Boris Yeltsin grew up during one of the most turbulent periods in Russian history as Stalin tightened the grip on power and the Nazis invaded. He was too young to fight. Yeltsin became an engineer, helped construct commie blocks, and felt disillusioned by the impracticality of the communist bureaucracy. He gained respect and power in his region of Sverdlovsk before going to Moscow. Yeltsin managed to keep his Kulak background concealed from the Communist Party, who wouldn't have allowed Yeltsin to join if they found out. Yeltsin clashed with the party elite in Moscow, but he could see the writing on the wall that the stagnant communist system, as it was, could not be sustained. He learned the politics of Moscow, resigned from the party, and established a reformist alternative that was probably only permitted to exist because Mikhail Gorbachev initiated both Glasnost and Perestroika. Televised parliamentary elections showed ordinary Russians the process uh, for the very first time. Yeltsin positioned himself and successfully campaigned for the post of Russia's first president. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Gorbachev resigned and Yeltsin remained in power. Yeltsin inherited the colossal task of transitioning Russia from a state-planned economy to a market economy. He initiated a privatization program to distribute state assets to the Russian people, but ended up creating an entrenched oligarchy and an economy fluctuating under the might of capitalist volatility. In addition to economic turmoil, Russia faced new challenges in the form of terrorism from separatist groups fighting for an independent Chechnya and cessation of Russian military operations in the region. Yeltsin established the Security Services, or FSK, to perform counterintelligence operations. They were a significantly less powerful successor organization to the infamous KGB. The FSK was soon rebranded as the FSB and allotted additional security responsibilities. Meanwhile, an up-and-coming Vladimir Putin worked his way through local government in St. Petersburg and later joined the Yeltsin administration. Putin positioned himself as a candidate for Yeltsin's successor alongside Boris Nemtsov, who was favored. Fortunes soured for Nemtsov when an economic crisis essentially blew away his chance at the presidency by eroding his popularity. The only real choice left was Putin, who succeeded Yeltsin and won the election. Putin built up the FSB to fight terrorism and allegedly unleashed the security services on his opposition and foreign adversaries. This whole series has been an adventure, and it's been fascinating to see the transformation of Russia from a medieval czardom to a global superpower to struggling with its own identity. Our focus has been on the most unsavory aspect of how states are made and maintained through the security services and secret police. To wrap up this episode, I don't really have any grand philosophical or key takeaways. That's really not my thing. And I'm saving my formal conclusion for the next episode, which um, we'll get to in a minute. But right now, I want to quickly tie up some loose ends, starting with Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin struggled with alcoholism, as we talked about, and ailing health until his death on uh, April 23rd, 2007 in Moscow. Yegor Gaidar, the architect the architect of Russia's price liberalization, was possibly poisoned in November 2006. He was scheduled to give a speech at an academic conference in Dublin. Shortly after breakfast, he fell ill and was found unconscious in the hallway. 
There was blood coming from his nose and blood in his vomit. On November 24th, literally the same day Litvinenko died, Gaidar was on death's door, but recovered. Gaidar thought it was a politically motivated attempted murder. I couldn't find lab work that showed the presence of poisoning, and then uh, uh, Anatoly Jabais rejected the idea that Gaidar was targeted by the Kremlin. Gaidar died on December 16th, 2009 at the age of 53 due to myocardial ischemia, which is which basically means a blockage of the arteries that supply blood to the heart. It's basically a heart attack. Now, what's interesting about Anatoly Chabais is that when I wrote about privatization like three or four weeks ago, Chabais was still in Russia. Following the invasion of Ukraine, Chabais quit his positions as advisor to the president and climate envoy in protest and was the highest ranking Kremlin official to do so, but he was not part of Putin's inner circle. In fact, on September 12th, 2023, Putin gave a speech at the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok where he mocked Chabias' recent relocation to Israel and took shots at Chabias uh, being Jewish, saying, quote, he is no longer Anatoly Borisovich Chabias, but some Moisha Israelievich. Putin is such a frickin' knob gobbler, man. Igor Gherkin, who shot down MH17, was arrested on July 21st, 2023 by Russian authorities on charges of extremism and remains in custody. He has been quite an outspoken critic of how Putin's handled this war. Gherkin thinks Putin has not gone far enough, but for the expert take on these matters, check out Chris Chops Andresen's The Eastern Border podcast. As for Putin, did you know he's still president of Russia? Who knew? Uh, the FSB, the military, and the police seem to be firmly in his grip for now. If he loses them, he's finished. He'll be tossed like a steak to a hungry Russian mob. More likely is that he'll follow in Stalin, Brezhnev, and Dropov and Chernenko's footsteps, serving the rest of his life as Russia's leader. The next person will be one we'd least expect to take power. And it could be uh, chaotic either in the whole country or just inside the walls of the Kremlin. But really, any predictions at this point of Putin's trajectory and succession are futile. One thing I keep thinking about when it comes to Putin is how exhausting his position must be mentally. I don't mean he can't handle the stress of the job, I mean the psychological toll. Yes, he is at the top and enjoys the comfort and money and guys with guns to keep him safe, but every time he eats, some small fraction of his mind must wonder if his food is poisoned. Every time he sleeps, he must wonder, will I be violently woken by a coup or wake up at all? He has to keep looking over his shoulder for the enemies he's created, and the people in his inner circle who would rather be him than serve him. I think about this same thing with Stalin. It's like the paradox of dictatorship. It has its perks, but the cost is isolation, stress, and paranoia for your own life. Can you really have true relationships like that? Putin supposedly stopped flying and instead travels via armored train, a risk assessment that could have benefited Yevgeny Prigozhin. Allegedly, Putin has survived several assassination attempts. In 2012, both Russian and Ukrainian intelligence thwarted an attempt on Putin, according to the BBC. The British authorities apprehended terrorists in October 2003 during Putin's visit to the UK, who plotted to kill him. Clearly, for some people, the power is worth the enemies and the attempts on one's life. But ask yourself, is this a way you could live? Anonymity is probably a better defense against death than a security force that you must keep happy lest they turn on you. In the end, Russia's security forces seem timeless and persistent beyond the years of any of Russia's most brutal repressors. The secret police are baked into the approach to government. If the past 450 years of Russian history covered in this series is any indication, the secret police are unfortunately here to stay. As we will find out, the secret police are unfortunately not unique to Russia, but are a fundamental pillar of statecraft. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this one. 
Next episode, we'll explore a short summary of this Russian secret police series. Then I will finally reveal what happens next. So please check that out. Follow me on Instagram at Secret Police Podcast for memes and updates. Share this show with your friends, your enemies, and those you are indifferent about. Tell a fellow history nerd like yourself about the Secret Police Podcast. Tell a complete stranger. And please do not poison any of your political opponents. Agents dismissed. Your leg is brushing against mine, and that's making the eagle's beak real big.